What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman, coming to you live from an undisclosed location. Um, <laughs> I'm scrambling out here, y'all. Uh, I'm actually on um, out of town with my family this week. Uh, we out here, and so I'm uh, just like last night. I'm, kind of, I'm coming at you from like a from a hotel out here, man. Timeshare, whatever. Try you got my little makeshift setup. You know what I mean? You know, but uh, you know, a little misshaven, but we're gonna make it happen anyway. You know what I mean? We're gonna make it happen anyway. What's going on, Vocab? How you feeling, bro? You're doing all right. You know, I think one thing that's missing, you you need a big giant light source right behind you. I know, man. So I actually have um a lamp that's close. I I did the best I could, man. No, I'm know. joking. Last time oh. you turned yourself into a silhouette by oh, having oh, a yeah. giant light source behind you, not in front of you. And right. you just turned into a silhouette. I was the mystery apologist, you know what I'm saying? You were the apologist <laughs> by the door. <laughs> I got I get the reference. So yeah, man. So y'all might hear my kids and stuff in the background, you know, uh you know, tripping away from time to time, but it's just uh because I'm sitting in the living room. So we'll, we'll see how that goes, man. But uh yeah, man. So uh y'all know why we're here, you know what I'm saying? You know why I'm here, you know, in the words of uh my guy from the Seahawks. I, I, now I'm drawing a blank on his name, man. Uh, the running back. Oh, you're here just so you don't uh, get fired. Marshawn Lynch. Huh? I'm here you're so I don't get fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mar Marshawn Lynch, man. You know what it is. What's good? We got some people in the chat. What's good? Nate 2 D2 in the building. We got Tyler Lott in the building. Mr. Green, what's happening with you? What's happening with you? Good to see y'all, man. Good to see y'all. So, um, yeah, go ahead and share this video. We, we, you know, we got a lot of content to get to. Y'all Y'all know how we get down. So, you know, go ahead and make sure you hit that like button, that share button. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm jovial generally, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, we are talking about some, uh, some pretty serious stuff right here, um, you know, here in just a second. So it is what it is, but, uh, vocab. Yes, sir. Hey, two nights in a row we broadcasting out here, man. Is, is, is that a record? I feel like, I feel like that's a, that's a record for us, bro. Uh, I'm trying to think. I feel like there has to be some other time we did that before, but it's possible. Yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty quick uh, turnaround, man. It might tie a record. Maybe it ties a record. How Maybe it ties a record. Yeah, that's cool, my, that's cool, my cool. thought. I don't know, man. Well, um, you're, you're the guest here, man. You want to uh, maybe kind of open this up? You'll kind of explain, you know, what we're doing here while I while I queue up these uh, video files? What do you do? Yeah, so uh, recently one of the members of what is arguably the most influential and historically significant Christian hip-hop group, of all time, one of the key members uh, walked away from the faith and made an announcement about it on Facebook. The Fanatic, also known as Brady Goodwin. Um, if you're from a different generation, it's hard to properly explain, unless you're like a historian of Christian hip hop, the impact the crossroom it had. And Fanatic was certainly a big part of that. He um, dropped several uh, solo albums as well as being part of Cross Movement. And uh, they did a lot. A lot of stuff that you see happening in CHH, if you pay attention to that genre, would be different as far as the, the faces and, and whatnot involved. And especially yeah, the question. tenor. Yeah, especially sure. the tenor. I mean, you know, for example, ultimately, Crossroom is the one who platformed to a larger degree McCray. And, of course, mm -hmm. that starts to reach. So there's a whole domino effect. But that's not the only one flame. You know, you go down the list, the truth. For sure. And uh, the Fanatic was part of that. He was instrumental of that. And they brought, uh, yes, a reform sensibility. But I think what was more important for the larger uh, culture was a sensibility of deep, theologic, deep theological exposition with really ill rhymes, like heavy wordplay, dope patterns that were much more advanced than most Christian rap artists. And they were dope artists at the time, but they weren't quite doing what Crossroom came out doing. And Crossroom, right. in a lot of ways, as far as lyrically, surpassed a lot of the secular counterparts. Now, they, of course, never ended up with the production. When I, what I mean is the budgetary production. But right. uh, that's a reality. So we set it in context. So if someone's like, who is this guy? Why are they talking about a person who's walked away from the faith? It's because of the, the impact and the legacy of Crossroom. And, and, and it ended up not just affecting rap it ended up affecting uh people in all kinds of other ways it influenced people to go to bible school and bible college and seminary it influenced people to church church plant it influenced all kinds of movements and that's really what they wanted they wanted a cross movement that 
was the reason for the group's name because I was listening to an interview by Cruz Cordero, one of the other members mm-hmm. recently, and that's what he was saying. And so mm-hmm. Brady was a big part of that. Post cross movement life, he took on the role really of an educator, especially in the realm of uh, youth. He would teach them ethics and whatnot and try to relate it to culture and do so from a biblical worldview. He also published, uh, wrote uh, several, uh, he wrote, I think it was two books, if I'm not mistaken, uh, books that were allegorical. So if you think of Pilgrim's Progress uh, or something like that, uh, not that it was Pilgrim's Progress per se, although I think the journey, at least on the first one, was to go to a soul food restaurant. But there's all kind of play on words with that. And so he was uh, an author and always was thinking of the next book type of thing. I think he put out four books. Uh, I read from one the other day. Here's one that I have right here from hip hop to Hollywood, the art of Christianity. Okay. And so, you know, and, and it's, it's sort of an, uh, across from was always intellectual, but he was sort of especially intellectual out of an intellectual group. Yeah. And then went to really what may be the most prestigious evangelical seminary, not necessarily the most prestigious school in the whole world. I'm not saying that, but within evangelical seminaries, the rigor, the, the school that's kind of known to have the most rigorous standards in a variety of ways is Westminster, Philadelphia, because there's also a Westminster uh, uh, in, uh, in the San Diego area. It's, it's, it's a dope school, but it sort of has a different tone to it. So, um, you know, went to a very rigorous uh, seminary and uh, started having doubts. And we're going to play some clips of these and then recently turned in a a letter to his church, withdrew his membership, and said he's also withdrawing his membership from the global church and believes the Bible is, he doesn't say this exact phrase, but I think this is the essence of what he says, reducible to human, to the human mind. Uh, right. Perhaps all religion is for him. He's going to come out more with what he believes, but he essentially seems to be a humanist now. He did not label himself as such, so I'm trying to be charitable. Uh, that's not a slur per se to say someone's a humanist, but it mm-hmm. seems like that's his position now. And he's talking about he's writing a book that's going to give the other side the voice to, 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 to kind of um, voice these doubts and his reason for the doubts. Although I don't really know if that's a new voice. It seems like that's what New Testament and a lot of biblical scholarship is already filled with because there's more yeah. Christians than there are Christians. But that's his perspective, I think, to the people that he feels are being uh, kind of protected or shielded about or, or by benign, benign falsehoods. Mm-hmm. Is essentially mm-hmm. the, now, this is all from a 24-minute video. However, there's somewhat of a track record recently by Brady Fanatic on Facebook that fills in some of the blanks if you've seen some of the stuff he's been posting and some of his interactions, which we have to an extent. So that's yeah. where it comes at. So what we want to do tonight, I believe, and I'm handing it back over, but you told me to stall for time, so I'm doing it, brother. Well, yeah, well, I, well, I didn't, you know, I, I forgot you had to get to Gab, man. So when I said stall for time, I didn't think you were going to filibuster, you know, for, uh, for you know, 10 minutes. But I'm, I'm yeah. joking, man. I'm joking. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a really good summary, though. That's, that's really now, if I'm going to filibuster, I have to come over there and touch you. Filibuster! Oh, just kidding. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, I see the word play. Okay. No, nah, okay. but. <laughs> no, no. Tell, yeah, go for it. Tell them what we're about nah, to do. No, but that is it. So what we're trying to do tonight is sort of a. Uh, uh, a probing analysis in depth, especially looking at some epistemological and philosophical considerations, because mm-hmm. there's not a ton of detail there, uh, but there are some larger epistemological and philosophical considerations. So we're going to go at those. And and I don't know if Brady's able to watch all the stuff coming out. You know, he doesn't, I don't think, know us, yeah. even though I have met him and it was always a good experience when I met him. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, you know, he's got a lot Yeah, I don't, I don't know him like that. I've interacted with him on, like, you know, Facebook and stuff. I mean, I met him, like, at a show and things like that, you know, back in the day. But, yeah, yeah, I, I don't really know him like that. Yeah. If he does, Adam, I'm hoping that he sees, okay, these guys, uh, you know, they're of the old mindset that I was at, but they they seem intellectually serious about this. Uh, right. Maybe we could have a conversation about it. At least uh, maybe we can even, by God's grace, give him some food for thought. But this is also sure. for you out there. Um, uh, if you're, you shouldn't be, but if you are shook up so bad by Brady, now you're questioning, you should not be. But if you are, we love you. And hopefully a conversation, a sane, sober conversation like we're going to have tonight will help you as well, by God's grace. No, that's, that's great, man. That's a, that's a great uh, summary of where we're at and where we're going. Um, and, and I do, I do want to say, because I mean, who knows, maybe, maybe he will watch this, um, you know, um, I don't know what his temperament is I, you know, to respond. Or, I, I don't know. You know, it'd be interesting to have some sort of a dialogue or something like that. Um, but, you know, from my standpoint, um, 
I mean, Laura knows. Like, I mean, it, I talked about it last night when I was on Damon's channel. The, the impact of, of Christian hip hop on my life has been, you know, tremendous. You know, I, mm -hmm. I actually um, on uh, Instagram, for, you know, for those who've been in the, the CHH world for a while, they'll remember a brother named uh, used to go by the name Mac the Dugalos. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, man. You know, and uh, he, he had commented on uh, Mason, Mason's thread, I think, when we had dropped the Urban Apologetics book last year. And I uh, hopped on it and I was just sharing with him, it was like, you know, just appreciation for the work that brothers like him had put in because I feel like what I do now as an urban apologist is an outworking of, you know, that movement. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm legacy of the CHH movement, kind of like you were saying, it, it wasn't just about rapping, but it was more so a movement that launched people in the ministry in various different ways. And so I've, I've always said that that's kind of how I, I see myself. And, um, you know, like, so when I, even when I was writing the Urban Apologetics, you know, book you know, or the chapter, I'm sitting there listening to Cross Movement. I'm sitting there listening to, mm -hmm. you know, Corey Redden Precise and, and you know, uh, you know, Jay Silas and, and, you know, all these Defy Life and all these guys. And uh, anyway, you know, that's just kind of how I came up, you know. But so that being said, I mean, personally, I don't have any ill will towards Brady. He's had an impact on my life. You know, I'm not ashamed to say that. Certainly don't have any ill will towards him, towards him now. But, you know, this is what we do. You know, I, I do believe that you can't build a strong community on a foundation of weak ideas. Uh, certainly can't build a, a, a profitable life on the foundation of, of weak ideas. And so when ideas are brought to the community or brought to the forefront that I think, um, you know, uh, could be detrimental in any sort of a way or, you know, need to be addressed, you know, we, we address them, you know. Um, now, that's not to say, let me, I'm be clear, like, I, you know, some of what he was saying, I can I can relate to because I mean, part of the reason why I'm here now is because I, you know, years ago had my own crisis of faith. You know what I'm saying? That's part of the reason why I got into apologetics. You know, I, I can recall, particularly me coming out of uh, the Word of Faith movement, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I was steeped in bad theology, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and that left doors open for me to have real challenges when it came to Christianity because my bad theology wasn't stout enough to stand up to the rigors of life, particularly as I, you know, became an adult and things like that. And so it left me with a bunch of questions that Kenneth Copeland and, and Creflo Dollar couldn't answer. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that just is what it is. And interestingly enough, I'll just share this real briefly. I, it's funny. I remember the cross when we came to um, Faith Landmark's ministries back in the day, where I was attending um, at the time, Richmond. And um, I was, you know, I, I used to MC. I did a little, you know, did a little something back in the day or whatever. Oh, I don't mean you can you spit, know. man. You can spit. You know, but uh, it, I remember, you know, one of the um, one of our, our, you know, the members of the church said, "Oh man, you, you should holler that cross with me, man. See if you can get on with him." And I remember saying to myself at the time, "Now, mind you, I was deep in like, you know, word of face stuff at the time." And I remember like, yeah, man, you know, they cool or whatever, but, you know, they don't be on the prosperity stuff like we be, you know, I, don't rock it. You know, I, I listen to them, but, you know, I'm not really with them like that, you know. And here I am thinking that, like, my theology was, like, super tight. And, you know, I was, you know, being gracious toward them, not knowing that I was, like, on some ill, you know, stuff. I was, like, out there or whatever. But interestingly enough, when I think about, like, you know, um, the songs that they dropped, particularly from uh, Holy Culture and um you know human emergency like th for whatever mm -hmm. reason in that era you know listen to their songs like the, the hot what joint talking about the prosperity gospel because i was a lyricist and you know i really took in what they were saying and that was the first step for me to get out of bad theology to get out of the yeah. faith movement you know what i'm saying and so i certainly pray praise god for that you know um so i said it to say like again for me, I had my struggles, you know, from from a faith standpoint. So I can relate to having questions uh, that seem difficult to answer, even after I, you know, got out of the word of faith. I mean, like, you know, just my nature is I'm constantly asking questions, and I'm not against that. You know what I'm saying I'm I'm certainly not against, um, you know, the idea that we need to explore as much as we possibly can, be rational people, be critically thinking people. And and follow the truth and follow evidence where it leads. I th I'm I'm all for that. You know what I'm saying I'm I don't believe that we should suppress doubts. I think that we should challenge them. You know what I'm saying I think we need to you know face them head on. And for me, in doing so, what I found was that man, like when I you know, my stoutest doubts, you know, that I had. You know what I'm saying when I faced them head on, whether it be the problem of evil or a number of different things, I found myself finding that Christianity is certainly a robust worldview that has all the resources within it. To address my concerns and, and it actually through that i became a stronger believer you know i'm saying by facing up you know to my doubts and facing my fears so to speak i'll leave it with this I, i'll never forget sitting at the job um 
go you know, show my hand here, but I was sitting at the job listening to Jay Electronica. You know what I mean? He had his joint. I think it's called like One with the Infinite or something, something with the Infinite or something like that. And at the time, I was kind of wrestling with you know uh, Christianity from um, in ter- from a textual standpoint. You know whether or not I'm going to find out that it's a ripoff from Kimid or something like that. And I remember the the angst that I felt sitting there at my uh, this overtime gig that I was at, listening to him like, "Dag, you know, what if I find out that Christianity is not true? What am I going to do?" And just you know the way I am, I couldn't you know leave it at that. I had to go research it out because I don't I don't want to live a lie. I don't I don't want to be living in something that's that's not true and giving my life over to something that's that's a falsehood. And so I pursued the truth as hard as hard as I possibly can, could, both the the safe sources and the unsafe sources, as, as we'll see him kind of mention here in a second. And I found out, you know what? Yeah, there's there's rational grounds to affirm that Christianity is true, and so that's that's why I'm here. So. Um, I said it to say that doubt doesn't have to, you know, lead to departure, you know, from the faith. You know, doubt doesn't have to, you know, lead to uh, an abandoning of the biblical worldview. Um, I think that just because somebody else experiences doubt or just because you experience doubt, that is, that's not necessarily the death knell, you know, to what the biblical worldview has to offer. Face your fears, face your doubts. And I think the truth is big enough uh, to overcome them. So um, I guess we'll just kind of get into some of these clips, man, and, and see where it takes us, huh? Let's do it. Yeah, man. Shout out to everybody in the chat, man. Got a lot of people up in here, man. We we, uh, we balling in here today. You know, good to see also, you. Good to see you. Also, shout out to the yeah. person who put these clips together. They did a really good job. Okay, great, great, great. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. It was you because you put the clips together. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so in other words, shout out to Vocab because Vocab was the one that put them together. Gotcha. All right. So we'll start with clip one. And we'll just kind of work our way through, man, see where it takes us. Oh, it'd be helpful if I push the button. He's right. a, oh, great, 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 great. And I am uh, denouncing the Christian faith that I have believed, professed, proclaimed, and defended for the last 30 years of my life. Oh, okay. So the, the first one, you know, I, I, some of these are short, some are long. You'll see the time yeah. just to, to have that right there, you know, because if you watch the video, it takes a while to get to that point. Right. But that's the, the that's the essence of the video is that it's a video where he denounces it. And, yeah, it's been 30 years. You know, he's been a he's been a believer for a while. Yeah, um, so that's a yeah. big thing. And it's been a lot of his time and effort, money, energy. Uh, in ministry. Yeah, facts, facts. Man. So, and, and you know, actually, I mean, there's not so much to say here, but at least y'all, y'all know we're not putting words in the man's mouth. I mean, he's very blunt and said he denounced Christianity, you know, uh, in its entirety and whatnot. I mean, that's that's what he's conveying. I do want to say this. Um, I think that sometimes in our um, sentimentality, you know, there, there's a tendency to want to be like, oh, no, nah, brother, you know, you, you know, you want to got soldiers, man. Like, oh, no, nah, man, like you you know, you still in the fold or something like that. You know, you right. see people kind of making comments like that. And on a human level, I understand. You know, I understand that people want to express caring. I think, you know, people want to, uh, they don't want to throw people away. And I think that that is commendable. Um, I guess kind of set the tone for, you know, where we're going here is, I, I, you know, I'm taking him seriously. You know, it's, that's kind of where right. I come from. You know, if you are saying that you're no longer in the faith, I'm taking you at your word and I'm taking you seriously. And, and my interest is, to engage, you know, where you are now, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So he's made a, you know, outright claim. He ain't right. <laughs> okay. You know, let's, let's take his, him seriously. And I think sometimes you can actually, it's almost disrespectful to not do that. Like, you know, just to kind of ignore yeah. somebody saying like, Oh, no, 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 brother, you still with us. Like, no, I'm, I'm going to respect you by taking you at your word. And then we work from there. You know yeah. Saying? He, he, he may say he has doubts still, obviously, sure. but him wrestling with the doubts, uh, sort of done in a sense from his perspective he's now at the past the doubting stage as a believer he's doubting as an unbeliever saying i denounce christianity yeah right do not believe it is true mm-hmm. all right let's get to the next clip let's get to the next clip all right here we go about 2014 uh i began to have doubts i began to wrestle uh, with my faith, I uh, recently sent a letter to the church, um, withdrawing my membership from the church. Uh, 
so he's saying the the hard doubts really begin in 2014 so that's eight years ago as far as the timeline he's giving and now recently gave a letter to his church saying withdrawal membership uh it could be 2022 when that happened it could have been late 2021 for example so that'd be eight eight years uh the process on that timeline would be well a little bit a little bit barely eight years basically more like seven yeah. something but uh that's that gives you an idea of the timeline so it's interesting because uh you know i mean it, it is what it is he hadn't come out yet but i think it was last year he was on a kb's podcast show mm -hmm. you know south side rabbi i think it was about a year ago and he was you know definitely saying some different stuff but uh it was it was able to be framed in a way where i think you could get some uh could get some traction with the audience still because they right you know, the, i remember the i think the main clip that came out of that was uh a fanatic says he doesn't he doesn't want to fight for the term evangelical mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. to try to claim that mantle or that label that was one of the main things i remember but you know you wouldn't necessarily know it's like a for sure thing because right. even as about a year ago you'd see him in some element of a public uh, christian space but now here we are we're in a different place yeah yeah and i mean I, you know just honestly, I, I don't think you know and, and i know you're not saying this but i wouldn't take him to be like deceptive you know, i can understand why somebody wouldn't be you know just kind of out themselves you know just willy-nilly i get that you know um but i just I, yeah i would just thought that i mean you know you just you never know man like you know i i would urge people i mean i am myself am a, a social media influencer you know i'm not saying i'm famous or something like that you know but um i think that we ought to you know, like any of us like like our our faith shouldn't be shaken you know what I'm saying uh just because a notable person the person who's of note experiences doubt because first of all you never know what's going on behind the scenes you, you really don't we still don't right. i can't you know infer anything that he hasn't expressed but you know we don't know what the man's life was like at this point you know what i'm saying in, yeah. in its entirety so you know i think there's one scripture i want to say it's in the songs it talks about like trust not in princes you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and um i think that can be applied a lot of different ways including um we, do, we don't have like a second second hand faith that's not what christianity is you know what i'm saying like this is something that you ought to be digging in for yourself such that your confidence in christ is independent of any other you know given person you know, so I'll, yeah, I'll move to the next clip. All right. It's getting warmed up. And I'm going to I'm going to put these thoughts out there for anybody else who thinks there's more to this. And I want to hear a different take. I want to hear a I want to I'm going to call it a more honest take, but maybe I, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying they're being dishonest, but I don't think that many of them are being um, is it honest? I don't think many of them have the courage to say what their theology really means when you hit the equal sign. If you say this and you say this and you say this, you hit the equal sign. To me, it doesn't equal and I still believe. And I'm going to challenge a lot of this. Um, so there... Um it's hard for me to tell who exactly he's talking to because it sounds like at one point he might be talking to sort of professional professors of Christianity, say like a seminary professor. But then it seems like he might be more focusing it on people who are sliding by under the radar. Maybe they're in a conservative institution, but they have kind of what are sometimes called mental reservations. Uh, about it, and so they're sort of they're, they're sort of secretly moderate or liberal, and uh, or according to what he's saying, uh, maybe open to an extent, but where if you add those things up that they would all say, it does not equal that they actually believe in Christianity anymore. So it's it's it was hard for me to tell precisely he was talking about because it seems like it could apply broader, but it seems like it's especially people in moderate conservative leaning institutions. Who are still there giving some kind of lip service to the faith but actually don't hold to it anymore it seems like that's the center piece of that comment mm -hmm. um and he's saying he's going to sort of write what they're thinking and so they don't have the courage to discuss it he does that it, i want that's what it seems like he's saying adam 
what's your summary of what he was saying there? Because I listened to this a number of times yesterday. I try to say, can I summarize this right? Because sometimes it's difficult because there's some ambiguous elements to it. Yeah, so I, I think you probably have a couple of things going on there, and, and I'm going to try to be as fair as I possibly can. I guess on the one level, and mind you, let me let me backtrack for here for a second. So, like, not all these clips are in chronological order, right? You know, in terms of, there, I did not um, put them in chronological order, right? Right. It's kind of like the Gospels. You know, they're written in, in uh, topical order. You know, what I'm saying, <laughs> depending on what we're trying to convey. But anyway, um, so th- th- that that clip actually comes like later on mm-hmm. in his video. And I think on the it's one hand, it's almost at the very end. It's almost at the very end. Yeah, you know, it kind of gives us an idea of where he's going. So I think that on the one hand, he would want to, um, you know, maybe I guess maybe he's trying to abstain from from, I guess you know, flat out accusing people of being dishonest. But then at the same time, it seems like that's really his perceptions, and, and maybe he's just trying to, you know, pull his punches at this time. But but it felt to me like that's kind of where he was going. He felt like there were people who were dishonest, and I think maybe another clip used the word cowardly. Or you know, didn't have the courage, if you will, to to speak up, and so he wants to you know stir the pot, you know. And I, I was, I was, I'll say this: I think that um, I'll, I'll talk about my own experience. I, I think that there are aspects of the biblical worldview. Um, maybe it could be something like you know how how the Bible was compiled or something like that. You know, where earlier in my days as a Christian, you know, I had no idea, and so. If you let's say if you grow up, you know, you, I mean, it sounds silly, but if, if you haven't really thought about it, maybe you think that, you know, the Bible just kind of fell out the sky one day or, you know, maybe like a book, you know, just descended into the hands of Paul and God, you know, God's like, yo, you know, give it to other people or something like that. I mean, whatever. But I think sometimes those gray areas, like what we don't know, if somebody's saying something skeptical in the, in kind of those regions, you know, it, it, it can feel scary to people. You know what I'm saying? I say, oh, man, I, I didn't know that. You know, like, you know, maybe they're not aware, you know, that when it comes to canoniz- canonization, you have a series of, of councils and different deliberations as to what, you know, texts would be included as scripture and which ones aren't to be regarded as scripture, you know, are to be understood that way. If you're not familiar with that history, then for maybe the average believer, then it could be jarring. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe, maybe it kind of is, is unsettling. And maybe he feels like he wants to kind of give voice to to those things that, that maybe unsettled him, and and he feels uh, you know, needs to be spoken on. Nevertheless, um, I think that if anything, um, I yeah, you know, I welcome those kind of challenges. I mean, I think it's great to to study further, and I do think that there's rational ways to respond to these things. But it, again, it sounds like he had certain people in mind, you know. But it also sounds like he has certain topics in mind where he, he feels that like he's going to ruffle some feathers. And, and he feels like that's where the dishonesty lies, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, my goodness, um, it seems like he knows. So some of the comments seem mm, maybe a bit self-centered or maybe a bit myopic, where uh, lots of people throughout history, and it really, I would say it seems probably, if we're talking about American society, increasingly feel completely liberated to come out as disbelievers it's uh, right. sort of a sort of a thing kind of right now yeah. uh, people talk about deconstruction and um they don't always end up reconstructing you know right. as far as any yeah. kind of biblical worldview a lot of times they'll kind of say that's the, the project's goal is to take away all assumed beliefs start from the ground up and see what we have and a lot of times when that happens they deconstruct themselves you know, right out of Christianity, uh, and they, they never build the house back up, so to speak. Right. Which, biblically speaking, the model for that would be that they left, and I mean, they speaking, mm-hmm. the 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 wise man's model. They left the rock, and went on over into the sinking sand. Biblically mm-hmm. speaking, ultimately, if if they're leaving, but my point is that he must know plenty of people coming out. I don't believe. From pastors to CCM artists to uh, the, kind of the regular people who, I mean, this is kind of what's going on. Yeah, it's not a new phenomenon, kind of, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's even kind of hot right now. You right, know, right, the, right. This, this is like on the rise, this thing. And uh, it gets news coverage uh, when it's deemed somewhat of import, but it's sort of, I wonder how much news coverage they can keep on getting. You know, there's different little media outlets when it's, be, 
maybe becomes so much more commonplace, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just, so, well, uh, I mean, to your point, I think, you know, maybe back in the day, say, yeah, I don't, I don't even know when this would have been, but let's say if you were to, you know, excommunicate, uh, and, you know, just, just dip out, you know, you would be leaving the Christian community to, you know, wander abroad, I guess, you know, just on your lonesome. But I mean, that's not really the case now. Like you said, it's, it's kind of the end thing. I mean, there's, there's a ready-made community willing and waiting for those who, who leave the body of Christ. I mean, it's, yeah, it's you're, and the see. world's eyes, Adam, you're kind of joining mainstream society when you do that. Right. Yeah. You're, you're a hero in some people's eyes, you know, and um, I think particularly on, on, in the social media realm, I mean, you know, this, you know, we have access to so many different people and so many different ideas, you know, there's, I'm sure there's some Facebook forum right now that's, that's itching for you know, Brady to join them as, you know, the agnostics of something, something, something. I mean, there, there's other communities out there, you know, unfortunately. So it's not, you know, it's not a scandalous and, or, um, you know, I, I we just seem to imply there, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's not like a new thing. It's kind of the thing right right now. You know? Yeah. yeah so. Now there may be, um, I mean, I think there, there are people at institutions and, and whatnot that hold mental reservations and uh, you know, they, they um, by, by certain things, it seems like they're no longer in a state of belief or perhaps some form of conservative theology, something like that. Um, but, you know, um, like, a lot of times these people come out and it's interesting specifically Westminster. So he went to Westminster. Yeah. Westminster uh, fired Peter Inns for viewing some of his publications and whatnot um, as betraying certain theological positions. And uh, they weren't saying, I, I don't think my understanding of the situation is they weren't saying that he's an Old Testament scholar to Peter Inns. Mm. You're not a believer, but it's that your theological convictions don't line up with those of the institution. Right. And uh, that was a thing. And then you next thing you know, you saw Peter Ends working with Biologos, which are like the the sort of apostles of evolution with an evangelicalism. They want mm -hmm. evangelicals to adopt this model or kind of be left in the dust as an anti scientific cult. And that's actually a paraphrase uh, from one of one of their guys who was affiliated with them, who I have a lot of respect for. I wish he wouldn't have said something like that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't Peter Ends. It was a different Old Testament scholar. Gotcha. But uh, you know, you you see that and. And Peter Inns was at Westminster. My point is that, you know, uh, Peter Inns was, didn't come out willingly, but it's like, uh, it, it doesn't seem, but, you know, he was saying these things and then he was outed. But again, it's not the only one. I mean, my goodness, uh, you know, you go down, there's quite a long list of, of people. Um, I, I still think to this day about the son of Francis Schaefer, Frank Schaefer, who oh, first yeah. went Eastern Orthodox and then is a kind of one of the, he's the rub saw in her wound kind of atheist like that kind of you know that's the kind of atheist he is these days. like piper's son too recently right you know he's, he's yeah he's you see him, out. yeah see him on tiktok now these are the children of folks i, I don't know if if uh, john piper's son i mean there's some videos of him talking with his father and stuff but frank schaefer francis schaefer's son he was like uh, an activist you know he was definitely uh and so my, my point is though that it's not as rare the and i understand the sentiment of people saying this and I'll only pass it back of this is brave or courageous because he's he is standing up and saying, here's what I believe. And I understand that to an extent. But guys, really, if we understand the way the world really is, there's a wide, broad path the Bible speaks about. And then there's a narrow, straight path. And even if you don't even believe that's a true narrative, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like we're living in some kind of Christian utopian world. You know, like yeah. as, as far as if you really hold to a true understanding of discipleship and live like a disciple, you really are, you know, uh, 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 this small minority of of people. That's that's where the bravery and courage comes from. Right. I mean, yeah, there's Christians. I mean, we saw, you know, the Coptic Christians getting their heads chopped off on on the sands by by members of ISIS and. You know, that was videotaped because they wanted to send a message. But most of these these kind of martyr slaughter, they're not usually videotaped like that. But this has been happening. I mean, that's the real courage. That's the real polycarp saying, you talk about burning me with fire, you'll be burnt with fire if you don't repent. <laughs> to the that's God. our core right there, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's our core. <laughs> that's the brave courage, to be honest, stubborn obstinacy that Christians have, by God's grace, shown because of the power of the Spirit. 
And that's that's the real courage of bold. And I'm not saying, oh, Christians in America are so brave and brave he's not. I'm just saying some of this, the way he positioned himself, I understand that's the way he sees it. But I think it was a little self-centered and myopic and inaccurate, some of the ways he positioned himself over and against a community. No, I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. So I've, I've lost track of a clipper. I think we're on number four. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. All right, there we go. And so I've been writing, uh, writing more to uh, the pastors and scholars and theologians who've all been writing on this issue, writing to sort of maybe challenge them and challenge their readers because I, I got to the point where I began to say, just tell me what you really, tell me what you really believe and stop dancing around the issue. And I'm not going to allow you to, to, to lie and mislead me. And I. Yeah, man, yeah. you know, this, this, you know, this, this little hot sauce on that one, you know what I'm saying? Yep. And this, this is where I started to kind of get, you know, I, I kind of want to grant, I understand he's conveying his, his perceptions, you know, what, what he believes to be the case. Um, but I think that if, let's say, if you don't believe that a particular argument is convincing or that what somebody is explaining about Christianity, if you, if you don't think that they're really bringing it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think we have to be careful not to impose, you know, um, motivations on people where we don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I know we're, we're going to get into some specifics here in a second where he starts to kind of laying out some of his, his, uh, the things that factored into him leaving. But, you know, that being said, you know, um, he wants to write to pastors and theologians and, and you know, be like, yo, just tell me what you really believe. Um, I, I, I understand he intends, you know, to have like this ongoing discussion. And what I'm, what I'm suspecting, here's what I'm wondering if we're going to see, come, you know, down the pike as he's laying out his different views. I wonder if he will be um, essentially instituting a, 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 almost like an inhuman standard <laughs> in terms of what, what other people, how other people should convey their positions. You know what I'm saying? Here's what I mean by that. So let's say that I have a particular view that, I'll just I'll just make make it uh, let me take it out of the abstract. Let's say if I have a view on, on on what a particular verse means, right? And I think that my view is right. You know, there, there may be some some pushback, and there, maybe there's some some counter arguments to my perspective on why I would translate this verse or render a verse that way. But nevertheless, I think that the the scale weighs in favor of of a verse being taken a certain way as opposed to some other way, right? But maybe I do have some reservations. I think that somebody can confidently convey what they believe to be true about a verse, even if they have some, you know, lingering, you know, doubts about, you know, okay, well, maybe I have some unanswered questions, if you will, you know, what I'm saying in that regard, you know, I'm I'm wondering if if down the pike, fanatic is going to say that that guy is, is who he's referring to is, is maybe being dishonest or or not saying what they really believe, you know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. uh, that, that's that's what I'm kind of wondering down the pike. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, it. it's interesting. He's like saying I'm my audience that I'm aiming at here are uh, the uh, sort of intellectual thought leaders or something of evangelicalism, right. you know, kind of more scholarly pastors and, and professors and scholar, uh, academics and whatnot, because he says like the people who have been writing on these issues and it's like uh, he seems to be saying, hey, I know you guys. Uh, actually underneath or similar to me with doubts and disbelief, but why aren't you saying it? And he noticed he also said, and they're readers. So it's, it's like yeah. people who are already trafficking these, these ideas where he views underneath all is, is, is doubt and disbelief. Now, the thing is on one hand, I want to say, you know, you mentioned this, don't buy into this fact that he kind of makes it like there's a conspiracy where, no yeah, one, that's about to go there. No yeah, one yeah. believes, but at the same time, I do think there's a deadly seeds of doubt in um, in uh, a lot of what Christians might say, and perhaps especially uh, what the intellectuals amongst us might write. I do think sometimes there's uh, seeds of doubt or non-theistic presuppositions that they adopt. Because that's what you have to adopt a lot of times to write for an academic audience. 
and then they proceed from there. Sometimes what's called methodological naturalism, for example. I guess you. They proceed from there, and then uh, if someone's saying, "Well, what's the underlying presupposition here?" You know, you kind of see what's going on. So at the same time, even though I'm kind of chastising Brady to an extent because he makes it sound like there's a conspiracy theory, as you mentioned, it's not as if, from my perspective, Adam, I'm saying, you know, you might have a, it's not as if he's completely chasing ghosts. And uh, I went to seminary. I'm a big advocate of seminary. But I do think this is especially true when you go higher up amongst sort of evangelical or evangelical-like elite because, and I don't know if this is the only reason, but there becomes a desire and importance to write for and impress your peers, especially. And that can be a dangerous game because you end up having to abide by their standards. And sometimes I've seen academics who start out kind of like, well, this is what I believe, but to play game, to play ball in secular academia as a Christian, here's what I have to adopt to proceed, or here's what I can't say, right? Yeah. But I, a lot of times you end up actually adopting the presuppositions. And I don't know if it's by osmosis. I don't know how it, but this, I do think there are some, that pattern does exist to a certain extent. And I think you can see models in the academy. And if you read yeah. between the lines of some high level intellectual uh, writing, uh, you, you can see that. And I think he's been exposed to some of that. And it's almost like, hey, you guys are kind of you, you like you guys should join me over here because I perceive you already being there. I think he's doing too much with reading people's intentions and beliefs because everyone right. doesn't hold things together epistemologically like he might. They might have a different system that may not be coherent, maybe whatever, whatever. But I think he's doing a little too much. But we'll see when his book comes out. Sorry, I know I went along on that. Go ahead, Brian. Brian. No, no, it's cool. I mean, because actually, I think it's very interesting what you said. So I think that. Um, it is the case, you know, that the higher you go up in academia, the more uh, unfashionable it can be to, to hold to certain views that we might consider to be traditional or just kind of like basic Christianity. Sometimes you. they'll use a, 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 a polite slur for that kind of writing. They'll say, oh, you're a co you're a confessional New Testament historian. Mm, you're, you're writing mm. confessionally. Right. And right, they're, right, they're right. saying like you have these pre-held dogma that are going to so you can't really do good work. Because right. your pre-held dogma is going to drive you to a conclusion. Well, now, so let's go there for a second. So, like, and this is kind of again on a human level, right? Let's say that you're that that um, you say you're an up-and-coming scholar, and you and you want to be respected among your peers. You know, perhaps you want to be you know tenured and teach somewhere, and and you know have your work published and and have it valued and stuff like that. You know, I I can see how if you're that guy. Mm -hmm. I can see how there would be this great temptation and, and a real struggle, an internal struggle, maybe to uh, maintain some fidelity to mm -hmm. beliefs that, you know, your peers, your academic peers are going to look in, at you with disdain. Just yeah. On the human level, we can see that. And I do think that is the case that under that pressure, um, I, could, I could imagine, you know, how, how people could want to steer away from that in their writings and so on and so forth. So and your brain, point, I don't think that he's or go. No, okay. to your point, I, I don't think that he he's chasing ghosts. I mean, I, I do think that um, to some extent, you, you do have probably some examples of people who are like that, you know what I'm saying, who maybe don't want to, um, you know, uh, own up to whatever their, their own views are in light of the condescension they might get from, from their peers. So maybe they do, you know, tuck in their fundamentalism, if you will, if you want to even call it that, you know, I, I may have found a better word, but, but you, you see where I'm coming from or? Their confessional beliefs. Confessional beliefs, right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, no, you're a hundred percent. And um, so if someone's out there listening, like, well, see, I told you you shouldn't go to cemetery, I mean, seminary or something <laughs> okay. like that, that yeah. is also short-sighted because why are you listening? Uh, why are you listening to us right now? And hopefully it's helping you because we, we are exposed to those kinds of things and we do dig into those areas. And when, when the Brady's of the world come out and they'll come out regardless of if they, they not, come, they don't just only come out cause they go to a seminary when they yeah. come out, wherever they come out of who's going to answer them. And, uh, I respect, you know, uh, we need people to work 60 hours a week as uh, gym coaches and everything else. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, right. I mean, Right. But uh, who's going to answer the person who's a, the full-time intellectual and academic? 
you need someone with some of the training. Once C.S. Lewis said something along the lines mm-hmm. of good philosophy must exist if for, for no other reason other than to answer bad philosophy. That's what he said, yeah. Yeah, I, I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. It's, it's and there's some truth to that. And so instead, I think the reaction should be let's support – institutions that are holding down the faith and holding down the intellectual side of things rigorous. Let's support people that go into those institutions and help them and pray for them and bless them. And we're, we're we're talking about seminaries, (laughs) guys, you know, if you're going to bash on seminary, then you got to ask yourself, what about everyone sending their kids off to public university where, you know, they got to take anthropology 101 and and learn how evolution is true and all this other stuff. Like, yo, you know, that's a whole other discussion, but go ahead. No, I was going to say, too, I think and, and I feel like we see this a couple of times, some, even some of the clips we're going to play in a second. But I think that there can be um, sometimes you can be so intent on being a critical thinker and, and want to be intellectually honest that you can almost <clears throat> privilege, you know, voices that are contrary to whatever, whatever it is that you currently hold. I think that there's like I put it this way. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a basketball guy. So let's say that. Um, and I've used example for other things, but let's say, it's, let's say that if you're going to go up, if you're Allen Iverson and you're trying to get a layup on uh, Shaquille O'Neal, I'm saying um, that's that's an old example. Let me use somebody for that. Joel, Joel and B. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> let's, let's go with Joel and B. Let's say that you're, uh, um, you know, Russell Westbrook. You're trying to go up on Russell Westbrook, and you're anticipating that he's going to foul you. you know, maybe it's the last couple seconds of the game or something like that. And so you're ready to like kind of lean into the contact, so hopefully you can still make the layup. I think sometimes people are so trying to they're trying to lean into the intellectual contact contact so much that they end up like missing the layup you know what i mean it's like you you just kind of lean in too far you know what i mean we don't have to privilege like the, the voice of the naysayer if you will i mean or the voice that disagrees with you i, I think it's fine to weigh out arguments if somebody presents you with something it's fine to weigh out the arguments and the evidence but i think sometimes we're trying so hard to 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 not be the you know blind faith fundamentalist that mm-hmm. we give leverage you know to to uh to other voices and i'm saying it's just like keep it balanced i'm saying like face it head on that's fine i mean but you, we don't have to grant like special credibility to those with whom we disagree and i think sometimes there can be a tendency to do that in and, the name of yep. being a critical thinker or skeptic you see what i'm saying yeah no 100 percent. and uh you know from what i know it seems the case that because there's this mainstream larger society and world and most uh, evangelical elites recognize they're in the tiny subculture of a society and of the world and so they understand that's all out there and so uh at most schools of higher learning or when you especially when you get up there you you, you have to be exposed to what the other side and sides are thinking um that's that's often part of what you have to do I remember uh, I felt like when I took Wayne Grudem's class, maybe I'm over over exaggerating, but it seemed like we were reading more people that we disagreed with than we were advocates of what we held to. Mm. That was a big part of what the assigned reading was, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, my point is not that evangelicals have mastered all the other arguments of the other side, but there I do believe there's a little bit more often exposure because, first of all, these ideas seep down in popular culture. So, you know, we're not even talking about media. We're not even talking about, you yeah. know, all the exposure to that in, 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 in public education and this and that. And da, 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 da. But I mean, especially at the higher levels, it's like, well, hey, what does this guy say? Understand this, da, 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 right? And you go down, and that's, that's part of what you've got to do. But rarely do you find in the other institutions, you know, uh, secular, just mainstream institutions in American society these days where it's like, we need to take serious what these evangelicals are thinking, so I'm going to have you read them and be exposed to them. Now, there are exceptions. I have a professor friend of mine yeah. who calls himself a relativist. He's an atheistic relativist, and he is a philosophy and world religions uh, prof at a local school here. And one of the main ways he teaches his students is he brings in advocates from other worldviews and lets them describe them, and then lets the question kids ask questions according to how he's been teaching them to analyze worldviews. Mm. It's a fascinating thing. The reason I know is because I've been invited to some of those. So mm. today we're having this Cal- conservative Calvinist. You know, <laughs> well, okay. what's that, right? And uh, it's a very interesting thing. And uh, but I think there's an exception to that. Now he does it in a very personal way because he's not assigning large bodies of reading. It's 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 at a it's at a this is at an undergrad level that I'm talking about. But I, I think it's more rare. My point is, guys, 
Yes, the other side, the voice and that, but when you take everything out, we are the minority voice. The people who believe the Bi who read the Bible and believe it's true, if you've been brought up in that environment or that's what you're exposed to, you think it's like that's what everyone says and the contrarian voice is like the distant echo. It's it's the opposite way in the larger scheme of things. We're this tiny little voice amongst this right. broad culture and broader world. And I get hearing the other voices, but but I'm like, yo, we, let's make sure we get our stuff settled first. Let's make sure we take care of, let's make sure we hear our voice first, like our answers, our reasoning, all that yeah, kind why of stuff. Not? And, and yeah. don't presume that our answers are somehow intellectually deficient just because it's our answers. <laughs> like, like yeah. you know, it's, it's okay to weigh those out just like you would any other, but let, let me get to the next clip. That's good, that's good, man. Man, we just getting warmed. We're like 45 minutes in. We're just getting warmed up. We haven't even gotten to the meaty part yet. You That's know? my fault, bro. You feel like you don't want to deal with any of this? You don't want to think about these things? You don't want to be privy to any of this? Unfollow me. Unfriend me. Uh, but I still love you. I love I love the legacy that I was a part of. I love the church. I think there's some hard but honest discussions that we need to have. And you may look at me as an outsider now, but know that I'm someone who lived, who's given the better part of my life and has been not just vocally or lyrically in a verse, literally in my life, been willing to die for the gospel. So you may see me as an outsider now if you want, but uh, I've always only ever been a seeker of truth and a relayer of what I believe to be true. So I must spark that discussion. You can join, you can fly on the wall, you can eavesdrop, uh, or you can ignore. Or you can respond but, uh, to. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be me, I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna love you the best way that I can. And uh, the best way that I know to love is in truth. Speak the truth in love. And the unbeliever closes his talk with a Bible verse because that was the very end of the video. Brady, right. if you love the church, why do you want to have hard, honest conversations to draw people out of it? That's a fair question. That's a fair question. And, and I, I would wonder, um, oh, man, you know, there's a lot. There's a whole lot of music. So let me back, back, let me back up for a second. So on the one hand, I think that, I mean, me, it's just, you know, this is my temper. I love that. I love hard conversations. That's, that's how I am. I get it. You know, maybe other people don't. I understand. You know what I'm saying? But I kind of, one thing I don't like, and, and this is one of the few times where I'll, I'll say something about, you know, how he kind of delivered this message, you know, in terms of the way he came about it. You know, kind of the whole thing, like maybe, maybe you see me as an outsider and that kind of thing. It's like, you know, I guess maybe he's anticipating people are going to come at him and come at his neck. Maybe that's why he said it. But it's like, bro, like you're an outsider. Like, like you said that you, you know, withdrew from the church locally. You drew, withdrew from the body of Christ. So, I, you know, I kind of wonder, again, it'd be interesting to hear his perspective, but I kind of wonder, like, like, what's that about? Like, bro, you are an outsider by your own volition and then by your choice. That's what you chose. And so if we come at you as an outsider, it's because that's what you've decided to be. That's your choice. All right, that's that's where you're at. Okay, cool. But you, like, I feel like sometimes, even in the church, like we're quick to embrace the big bad Christian narrative. You know what I'm saying? Yes, there's mean Christians out there. I'm not saying that there aren't. Yeah, I, obviously that's the case. You know what I'm saying, but I just feel like sometimes, man, you know, we we can allow we can make martyrs out of people that just aren't martyrs, bro. You right. know what I'm saying? So when it's like, yo, you might see me as an, as an outsider. Let's, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm from the old school, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we call a spade a spade. It, 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 that's just what it is. I'm saying, if, you know, you, you said earlier in the video that you out. Okay. So, you know, if, if we engage you in that manner, if people engage you in that manner, um, then I don't, I don't like, I don't see why there's a, that needs to be a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just what it is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's strange because. It's like, hey, I denounce my Christianity. Now, you might see me as an outsider, Christians. Well, I mean, that doesn't mean we hate you. Church, we should, you know, don't let your emotions get the better of you. Doesn't mean that we have to say nasty stuff about you. But, but I mean, it doesn't mean we don't see you as a brother in humanity. It doesn't mean we don't care about you. It doesn't mean we can't see you as a friend. Um, that, like I said, in my personal life, he wouldn't remember, I doubt. But every uh, personal interaction I've had with Brady has always been positive. 
two specific times. I'm not going to go into details, but but uh, one in, in the Columbus, in Ohio area. I think it was more in Youngstown area, but we we drove from Columbus. They had a show in Ohio, and we John Rubin and the Showcase MCs opened up for Cross Movement. This is in the, kind of the beginning stages of their of their like they only had one album out at the time. Very positive uh, time with Fanatic, out of more so really than anybody mainly. Uh, then I ran into him twice at Crewvention, Atlanta and Orlando. Uh, and then also when I, I booked their last show, the history tour, I booked it here in Phoenix at a church and uh, had a brief but positive interaction with him every time. But I mean, Brady, you're, you're saying you're not a Christian. I don't know if, if it's a longing for the community and maybe because that's a strange thing to say. I love the church because he pictures the church as uh, being filled with people who um, – have believed falsehoods and in some cases are promoting falsehoods perhaps on purpose yeah, you know uh, right, it's, yeah. it's a, you, you do see the wrestlings there and i'd hate to say this but i think the nostalgia he has for the church and the bible sure. and if he continues on the trajectory you're going to see the nostalgia lessen the farther he gets away the yeah, further he drives down the road too. and the smaller the house is in the rear view mirror he's going to Forget about that house. I think that's just I think that's just human nature. I'm saying there's nothing about him specifically. I think that's just how things tend to roll. You know what I mean? But you know, yeah, we'll get to the next clip. I don't even know which one I just played. (laughs) I think you'll know when you started. As I began to teach more in secular academia, I knew that my faith was going to run into uh more academic questions and so to prepare for those more academic questions i went to a place that that existed to train people to do that westminster theological seminary started back in the 1920s and the aim of westminster was to defend the christian faith against atheism and liberalism and so i knew that would be a great training uh for where i was headed in secular academia but uh as i was there like i said they they train you in how to uh, presuppositionally look at a worldview and to kind of go from the ground level to, to deconstruct it. And uh, while I was there, I was forced to not just look at somebody else's faith and say, if you remove this jingo piece from, from the tower of your faith, what happens to it? Well, I turned that lens around. So well, what happens if, if someone were to use this uh, uh, this theological judo on me. If you remove this jingle piece from the construction of my worldview, what happens to it? I begin to ask those more penetrating questions and I begin to second guess the answers that I was getting and the answers that I would give someone else if they asked me that same question. Now we're starting to get into the nitty gritty. Mm-hmm. You know, this now I'm, I'm gonna say this, man. This, like this, there was a couple parts in this video, in, in his video, that that I was super confused about, and this is one of them. You know, so he says that he was trained. You know, saying that he had, he was anticipating getting into academia, or that he was aspiring to get into academia. He wanted to engage, you know, uh, I guess objections to the faith, or you know, he wanted to engage things on that level. And so he says, you know, he goes to Westminster and whatnot, and he was trained to presuppositionally break down other worldviews. And he said he, he flipped it, you know, saying on Christianity. So, okay, well, what if I take that jingle piece out of Christianity? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I mean, particularly like presuppositionalism, that's kind of like the idea, right? Like the idea is that if you take this lens to uh, of, you know, evaluating the Christian worldview, then you'll find yourself with uh, a, a worldview that can stand that test, whereas others, you're going to, uh, whereas other worldviews, you know, you'll be able to take that jingle piece and see how it falls apart. That's kind of like the idea, you know, so it's, it's like, it seemed as though he felt that like he was doing something novel or different by taking a presuppositional lens and applying to Christianity, when essentially that's, you know, kind of the underpinning of what presuppositionalism is, 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 is comparing worldviews and seeing how they stack up based upon how those worldviews are constructed. Does is, is that, is that make sense? Or, yeah, presuppositionalism is a, an apologetic methodology. There's a heavy emphasis on the self-revelation of God. Scripture as being self-authenticating and the ultimate authority. 
and ultimately the triune God as a metaphysical ontological reality being the necessary precondition for all metaphysics, for all of reality, right. especially the area of epistemology, but also in the area of ethics and, as I mentioned, metaphysics, meaning every element of reality being contingent upon God. And so the idea is the Christian assumes that and therefore where God has spoken is true takes that into battle, so to speak, intellectual battle, and then applies Second Corinthians 10, 3, 5, cast down arguments and lofty vain imaginations and all that, right? And, right. and that, that exalt themselves of the knowledge of God. And then the idea is that every unbelieving worldview of any variety uh, will fall because it's ultimately not built upon the rock, but built upon sand. And so when the storms of intellectual rigor come, the house will fall. But the wise man who built his house upon the rock will stand. Well, and I see what's interesting to me, though, and, and again, I'm, I'm taking it that, you know, well, he used the word presupposition. So I'll just go go with that. So when it comes to a presuppositional approach, regardless of what approach you take to apologetics, actually, it's not so much about taking a jingle piece out of somebody else's worldview and then seeing it fall. Okay, yeah, well, not and, what, and then that's, that's not, not what, what it that's is. That's not what presuppositionalism is. I don't know what that is. That's almost like if someone's right. holding to what's called a foundationless perspective and you take an element out of their foundation, but that's not what presuppositionalism is. So I don't for sure. I so I don't know what he's that. referring to. Right. So so for example, like I might say that I, I and this, I actually argue this, I don't believe that um I'll just say an, a naturalistic or atheistic worldview has solid grounds for rationality, our ability to reason. You know what I'm saying? And I do believe that in a theistic perspective. You know, we do have grounds for that. You know, that's just a simple example. Now, I'm not saying that, OK, well, if you take something out of uh, atheism, they no longer have grounds for, um, you know, rationality. I'm saying that if I'm um, an outsider looking into that worldview, they don't have what's necessary to ground rationality. It's not what I'm taking out. I'm saying right. they already don't have what's, what's necessary. And God likewise, is the necessary precondition. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so. Any any worldview, if you take a piece out of the worldview, you haven't rightly analyzed it. You just straw man it. <laughs> that's, that's really what yeah. you've done, right? Yeah. You, you, what you do. So what he described was, okay, well, if, if I if I take this jingle piece out of that worldview, does it fall apart? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you can do that with anything. That's, that's called straw manning. But ultimately, what we want to do as, uh, in apologetics, or you know, I'll just take that word out of it. If you're analyzing a worldview, it's not a matter of trying to take something out of it. It's evaluating it as it is and saying, okay, well, how does it stand up in terms of its ability to explain this or that phenomenon or this feature of reality? And like you said, I, I certainly affirm that, you know, that God's a necessary precondition for whether it be, you know, rationality, morality, aesthetics, and, and things of that nature. But I thought that was a real strange way to, if, if he was describing presuppositionalism, it, it sounds to me like he got it wrong off the bat. You're saying perhaps he's describing something else. I, I don't know, you know, but. And whatever he, however you described it, I'll just put it this way: worldview analysis doesn't work like that. Saying <laughs> like when you're when you're analyzing worldviews, it's not okay. I'm going to look at this this worldview over here, see what happens if I take that piece out. That's not good worldview analysis. And so if if how he described you know worldview analysis, what he was doing, and then he turned that on Christianity, well, of course you're going to arrive at some some you know conclusion, some heinous conclusion about Christianity because you're not doing it right. You know what I'm saying? So it'd be interesting to hear him explain that further. No, yeah, because no. part of, I believe, for uh, a worldview to be true, uh, there has to be coherence. The set of right. beliefs over here have to be able to network and match up in some way, cohere with a set of beliefs over here within the same system. Right. Um, taking them out doesn't prove anything. We're putting a new one in that doesn't belong doesn't prove anything because – it does the opposite of a, legit, a legitimate worldview critique. And my understanding is he was at Westminster doing graduate level work, like master's yeah. level work. So yeah, I'm, that's what he said, yeah. I'm incredibly confused how he is misunderstanding and mis or at least misexplaining presuppositional apologetics. It's not about taking out Jenga pieces. It's about saying, uh, here's what you say your Jenga pieces are. Will it even stand up? That's kind of that's cool. Well, and if they're teaching uh, apologetics at Westbrook, that's they're teaching a presuppositional approach. Yeah, Case got all of Case got all of it. 
right. is the one who runs stuff over there. Okay, Scott yeah. has a book, for example, called uh, Covenantal Apologetics. And in Covenantal Apologetics, you know, the whole book is about a presuppositional approach. What, what, um, See, that's presuppers, what I'm saying, bro. I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't this, understand. this is. Presuppers, here's what they say they're doing now. Sometimes people get annoyed by the use of this verse, but I think it applies if you under if you're charitable with what we're trying to do with it. It's Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. Listen to this, because everyone's heard this verse before, but watch how it can be applied. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. The very next verse, everyone, says the opposite thing. I want to show you. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own eyes. And these are Proverbs, so people have understood these are things that you apply in certain situations. It's the nature of the proverbial literature. And so that's been one explanation for this, and I think that's true enough. But what apologists who are pre-sup have said, this can apply to apologetics. So the way that you answer a fool not according to his folly is that you don't assume his assumptions with him. So if he says, well, I don't believe miracles can happen, you don't have to assume that that's the case when you proceed. You don't have to – if he says, I don't believe that there can be any realities that are immaterial, you don't have to buy that assumption moving forward. So you don't answer him on what he's saying must be the case. You answer him according for biblical worldview, but to show him how it's, how it's true. You're saying taste and see that the Lord is good in essence. You're trying to say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy your presuppositions. Let me show you what my presuppositions are. And now they make sense of reality. But one of the ways sometimes you have to do that is to get the fool. And this doesn't mean the dumb person. This means the person accepting essentially a non-God ordered worldview or non-God centered worldview, uh, or who who doesn't listen. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. There you say, now let me assume what you hold to be true. And let's see if we can get things like, so this is especially if you're talking to an atheist, for example, can we get value? Can we get meaning? Can we get purpose? Should we even be able to get aesthetics, meaning beauty? Should we be able to get that? Uh, should we be able to get the laws of logic, which are immaterial, immutable, and unchanging, uh, which is another word for immutable, and uh, seemingly invisible because they don't, they're don't they not located in space and time anywhere. The laws of logic are necessary for all right thinking and actually necessary for reality to be how it is. That way the universe can't exist, not exist at the same time in the same way. That's an impossibility. So the law of non-contradiction automatically holds. You can't have that, but yet no one can hand you a law of logic. You can't trip over one because they're not physical. They're not located in space and time. So the other one says, answer a fool according to his folly. So you'd say, here's why you can't even have uh, logic, for example. Or if you say, let's say evolution was true. Can we get meth uh, ethics and morals out of evolution? And sometimes we can point to, for example, evolutionists who say, no, you can't, like Michael Roos, who says, I appreciate when someone says this is right or that's right or that's wrong, but really that's all illusory. Morals and ethics, they're illusory. And I was a paraphrase of the quote, but the word illusory is something Michael Roos, for example, philosopher I believe down in Florida, specifically used. You are illusory. It's an illusion, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I bring that out it. to say that's what we would do. So, so Brady, with all due respect, I hear what you're saying. You're viewing it as sort of this intellectually honest journey, and you've put the guns out on the atheists and the humanists. And now you said, well, let me put the guns back on my worldview, and you killed your own worldview. You got to keep going, though. What's your worldview now? Are you turning your philosophical, theological, mm -hmm. intellectual guns with the same rigor? Because you haven't explained fully what your new positions are, but whatever – and I say this respectfully, but whatever your Bradyism is, meaning your individual idios idiosyncratic worldview that you now hold to, it will not be able to hold up. It will not meet the necessary conditions that you need for all those important things in life. But here's what often happens. It gets ignored with the unbelieving worldview because there's an impracticality dis disbelief. And that's why David Hume said at one time when he contemplated some of these things, he said, when I think on these things, and I'm paraphrasing, it was in a somewhat different context, but David Hume, atheist philosopher, said, then I just go play a game of backgammon. <laughs> Meaning like when I get too deep in this, I do this. I can't really answer it. I just go distract myself with entertainment. Brady, what are you doing now? And because I mentioned this illustration to others, if someone says I don't eat meat anymore, they're not telling me 
most likely they don't eat anymore. They're saying they don't eat meat. So what's the substitute for protein in your diet, for example? So what I'm saying to Brady is you don't eat meat anymore, but what do you eat? What's your substitute? If you're not forthcoming with specifics of what you believe now, you can't play the the guys or the role that you've been so intellectually honest and you're you're being a ruthless, uh, sort of ruthlessly yeah. rigorous. Because at yeah. the end, he said, "All I've wanted to be is a portray of truth." What about what you're holding now in your that, deck of cards be, that you've given yourself? That's going to be the clincher for me, man. Because again, like it's it's so early in the game, you know, it, you know, we really can't. Uh, we don't know all, all of where he is now. And, you know, shout out to my wife who's in the chat, y'all. Hey. <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, we, we can't, we don't know exactly, you know, all of where he's going to go. But I, but it's stuff like this in this initial, you know, um, in his initial comments that kind of was red flags to me because I'm like, you know, that that's that's not presuppositionalism. Like I I I know a little bit about apologetics. I mean, there's there's different approaches. I mean, you have the, the evidentialist approach and so on and so forth. When it comes to presuppositionalism, that's just saying it. And at the end of the day, you know, when he talks about you know um, taking some of these questions and then turning them against his own worldview, I mean, honestly, I think that's you know, I mean, I do that all the time. You know what I'm saying like I I. Argue, I, I tell my wife all the time. I, I debate with myself five times before I go to the debate with you know with somebody else because I, I I do want to find the holes in my own responses. But nevertheless, to your point though, if you abandon Christianity, then you're telling us that you know, well obviously you must hold to something else, you know. And I wonder if he's going to do like uh, in, in the words of Lecrae, is he going? He said uh, I doubted. I had to doubt my doubts and let faith in. I, I wonder if he's going to doubt his doubts. You know I'm saying I wonder if he's going to be as stringent and principled about. Um, you know, going at those, whatever it is that he believes now. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see what he does there. Let me play this next clip. All right. And I actually still love the gospel. I actually still love the the way that the message has been massaged to and, and presented to us. The way that the scriptures present themselves, the various authors. I get it. I just don't believe it. Massaged. The message has been massaged. The message has been massaged. Certainly it doesn't mean that the Gospels had a kink in their vertebrae. What he's saying is, here's the message and it's been tailored and almost like this fabrication has been presented in a emotionally appealing way seems to be what he's saying because uh, why would he, but I, I'm, it's confusing because why would he appreciate that? It seems like he's right. along the lines of, I appreciate sort of the aesthetic or literary quality, for example, of the, of the, of the work. Um, but, but the message itself um, in his newfound, you know, humanism, um, the ultimate message, the crux of it, he, he can't hold as true because it's now antithetical to what he's, what he's parading. So it's it's strange. Yeah, I think you're seeing the the battle, but it's of his Christian residue. And if he continues on the track, the Christian residue is going to drip away and you're going to be left with a more stark naked humanism, I believe. Yeah, it's kind of like the, the whole cut flower analogy. You know what I'm saying? When you cut a rose, uh, you know, from from its branch, you know, from, from its body, whatever they grow on, <laughs> you know, bush or something like that, then, you know, it, initially it looks you know, as it was, you know what I'm saying? But give it a couple of days, you know, even if you got it some, some good water, you know, it's not going to be quite the same. You know, it's kind of like that. It'd be interesting to see how that kind of goes. But I mean, to your point, though, um, I thought that was kind of interesting to, to say that he loved the gospel, you know, that's been massaged. I mean, that would that would entail um, or suggest, you know, rather that there was some original version of the gospel that then got kind of reshaped into whatever it is that he's saying that he's appreciating. And I, I'm, I'd be interested to see how did he arrive at that conclusion? Like, you know, what, what is it that he believes to be that original message? You know, because there would have to be some original message for in order for it to be massaged or else there wouldn't be anything to massage. Right. So, you know, what is it? You know, what evidence would he provide? You know, that there was some um, uh, precursor, you know, to, to the gospel that he's now saying has been massaged. You know, that's, that's a pretty strong statement, I think. Um, whoa, 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 bro. You have Muslim by choice in your live chat. 
I've seen him. I've seen him a couple times. I'm not exactly sure who that is, but I've, I've seen him a couple times. Choice too. is like super well known in the world of Islamic uh, polemics and evangelical apologetics. One of the main things he does <laughs> is highlight. He's been trolling um, for like a while, but okay. <laughs> well, one of his main things he likes to do is highlight evangelicals' beef and dissension. Ah, that's that's okay. a lot of his videos have to do with that, or or uh, sometimes what might be viewed as Christian bad behavior. You know, if you right, see a, right, right. a Christian acting up, you know, he, he likes to highlight it. That's fascinating, though. But he actually has a clever comment. So Muslim by choice, even I though I see, see you and your sneaky ways, how you love I to promote you. beef, you're like the Vlad of Islamic polemics. <laughs> I do like Vlad. <laughs> yeah, that, that's who he is. I do give you a shout out on this. He said this. I guess the title of his next book would be Seeking Jesus, Finding Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> that's not bad, man. <laughs> so shout That's out to Muslim by choice and your sneaky okay. ways. He's the oh, he's the man. FBI of the black community in the '60s. You know, fomenting division. You know, that's a, he's, that's he's, that guy. He's he's coin tell pro. That's, that's, that's yeah, he's he's totally <laughs> Islamic coin tell pro. <laughs> he's the Islamic coin tell pro. We oh, see man. you, but that was good, bro. Yeah, Sorry, but I don't even know where I was going. No, it's it's all good. I'm gonna go to the next clip. It's all good. So now I know who he is. He's, I feel like he's been coming to my stuff for a while. I've, I've seen him before. You know. And I actually still love the gospel. I actually oh, still love wrong clip. My fault, wrong clip. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it seems like he might have been gospel, not gospels, but still the same idea uh, to an extent. But that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. And I just went and I researched and I, I got to a point where I said, you know what? I think I get it now. I think I understand. When I hold the Bible in my hands, I think I understand what I'm holding now. I think I understand it now better than I ever have. And I don't believe it, but I understand it. And mm. well, it is what it is, I think yeah. I understand what I hold in my hands when I hold one of his books, the writings of an apostate. And I say that with all love, brother, but my yeah. goodness, my goodness. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. What comes to mind is uh, actually a quote from uh, from from Brady, one of his, and I, I think it was one of the cipher tracks. I can't remember what, exactly which one. I, I feel like it was off of higher definition, maybe. But he had this line where he says something like, "Maybe I'm the last of a dying breed, like a dying steed running his last lap with blinding speed." You know what I mean? And it was just, it was a hot line. You know what I mean? It is. Um, but but dag on it, man. It's just a shame to, to see that that's that's just not true. You know what I mean, he's just, you know no longer running that race. You know what I'm saying? Um, but but it seems like he's implying that, you know, the Bible is indeed uh, essentially a human invention. You know, it, to mm -hmm. him, maybe even a, a somewhat beautiful one, but ultimately um, a human invention. And I think there's, there's a couple of things going on there. You know what I'm saying? One, again, I'm just kind of throwing, up, throwing out things that I think would be interesting. It would be interesting because he's going to talk about theological presuppositions. It'll be interesting if he exchanges um, what he believes to be theological presuppositions that cause him to doubt the Bible. Well, I'll just say he exchanges the theological um, presuppositions with naturalist ones, you know what I'm saying, with, with secularist presuppositions. You know what I'm saying? I think that's going to be interesting. So, for example, you know, you do have a school of thought that would say, no, it's not the case that the uh, prophetic writings are indeed prophetic. You know what I'm saying they were they were written after the fact um, to give some sort of credence, you know, to the scriptures. You know what I'm saying you have this. I always get the letters wrong, J E D P or you know whatever. Um, and and some of the um, fuel behind why they don't take the books to be prophetic is because they don't believe that <laughs> being prophetic is possible. They they you know, take a naturalist lens and apply them to the scriptures, right? So it can't be the case that somebody's being prophetic because we know that's not, you know, we know that nobody's prophetic. Nobody's hearing from God. So now we got to find another explanation. Ah, you know, they were, they were written after the fact. You know what I'm saying that's that's a presupposition that, that one would bring to the text, you know. And I think that, you know, there's a there's a presupposition of naturalism that I would say is unjustified. I think that there's solid grounds to affirm that naturalism is false. You know, but yeah. I wonder if he will be exchanging you know what it, the pre, the theological presuppositions that he held before with uh naturalist or atheist uh, atheistic presuppositions and then using them 
you know, um, or will he be consistent and say, I'm just not going to bring any presuppositions to the text. And he would be the first human being in human history to do so. I don't know how you don't bring back. I don't know how anybody could not bring background perspectives uh, you know, as, as they read the text. Everyone like, does. And even on a non-Christian does. philosophy, I right. think Kant uh, showed that, you know, and I, th- I think a lot of people understood the reality of that. You, you know, really what you're talking about is Romans 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Mm. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans one twenty two says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, showing that whenever you kick out God, the ultimate, the supreme being, whenever you kick him out of the system, you replace something within creation instead. Mm. And often this is seen rightfully so to an extent as an, as a general description of idolatry. But it's not just that because it's any exchange of the creator for the creature. And that's what happens when humanism is the pinnacle. That's what happens when naturalism and almost is definitional to that. And that's what's going on. By the way, I found uh, the lyrics you mentioned. Check it out. I'm strapped with analogies of faith, waving God's aroma so your soul can see how good he tastes. I'm starving for him. You are too. You're probably wondering, who are you? Maybe I'm the last of dying breed like a dying steed running his last, ra- running his last lap with blinding speed. Or maybe I'm stocked from a new breed, crops from a new seed, growing in the soil to earth. If so, give props for the new me. God's doing a new thing. I'm a product of his toil and work. He's a master craftsman. He craftsman after the fashion of the last Adam, not the first. The, cur- the first was cursed. We all take after the first one from birth. That's why we must be born again. Otherwise, it can never be on again. So if you dare to listen, warning you, we will hit content that is very Christian. That's from, oh, B- that's from yeah. B-Side on Fanatics album. It's called okay, B-Side. got you, got you. Hey, man, I, whatever it was, hey, one thing you can't take from him, Fanatic's cold on that mic, though. That's the thing. Yeah. He's cold. Yeah, you can't take the – the man he's, is cold on that mic. He's you know cold. Ain't, ain't nothing you can say about that, you know, but there, there you go. All right, cool. Let me – all right, here we go. Next clip. They were teaching me how to do uh, apologetics. I have been doing apologetics for 25 years on the streets, um, dealing with Hebrew Israelites and five percenters and uh, right knowledge, Malachi, York, and all that. I've been doing uh, urban apologetics on the streets for 25 years. Uh, The reason I played that in the context of our conversation and why it became a self-contained clip is because I was kind of complaining that he was using his length of time or service as leverage, whether it was incidental or accidental. But nonetheless, it's interesting that he's saying like what we're doing, he had been doing. And that's definitely true uh, in the sense of – Street apologetics, urban apologetics, street level evangelism, title of my new book, by the way. Because if you look, if you look, uh, a lot of us heard, remember on Heaven's Mentality, they had those little interludes yeah. where they were out in the streets, uh, ostensibly of Philly, sharing the gospel and saying what they would say, right? And uh, one of the main ones was right before the song Dust began. If you listen to Dust, which is fanat- one of Fanatic's solo joint on Heaven's Mentality, the beginning interlude because it's attached to the song. So if you like go listen to Dust right now on a streaming service, it's going to start with a little witnessing interlude. Yeah. And then begins his song Dust about the finiteness of man, essentially the, 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 the fact that he's finite, which is pretty dope. The creatureless, the creatureliness of man is really what that song's about. And mm-hmm. that's a fascinating thing. You know, we hadn't really heard that at that level. Just the little snippets made a big difference. And you know, it, it, and you can see it also come out in their in their verse. And I know it's Ambassador, but, you know, on Ambassador's first album, he had a song called Apologetics. I live and die for what I believe in. Right. Oh, yeah, and the yeah. whole song was called Apologetics. Right, and right, so, right, right. you know, that was always an element. That's why they would talk about this group says that they say this. But, you know, check this. So that intellectual awareness of the doubts of Christianity and the polemics against Christianity, especially within the urban landscape, were very real to them. And especially so in Philly. Philly has a heavy heavy Hebrew Israelite presence, uh, maybe second only really to New York ultimately, and it's a little more concentrated in Philly. Mm. And they've got the Tanakh only ones uh, that are pretty heavy there. They've got all kinds. So, uh, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't think he's exaggerating at all, but it's fascinating again that you can do that and yet end up here. Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's a cautionary tale, right? You know, and, and we'll get into this uh, some in a second. But, you know, I, I love doing apologetics. I'm saying I, I love, you know, studying philosophy. And, you know, we, we, you know, me, we talk like three or four times a week 
You know, this, mm -hmm. this is what we talk about. This is this is what we do. You know what I'm saying? Um, nevertheless, bro, apologetics can't keep you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, getting a degree in theology, it, it can't keep you. That's just the reality of it, man. You know, I think that there's 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 more to this Christian walk than propositional knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Which we'll get into that in a second. It's, just, it's not just like what you know. You know what I'm saying it, there's more to it than I mean. The reality is like, like again, this is what I do 24 seven. There's questions that I have about things, you know what I'm saying? I, and that's that's partly why I do what I do because I love researching them. Mm -hmm. And then when I learn stuff, I share it with other people. That's what I do. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But um, if you think that you're gonna like kind of study your way out of like, okay, I've been doing this for 25 years or whatever. Okay, I mean, that's cool, you know, but um, the, the notion that you can do, be engaged in something like this for 25 years, you know, um, and somehow that, you know, adds some level of credibility. I mean, to, to where he is now, I just, I don't see it. You know, it just means that um, you were doing it for, for quite a long time and, Evidently, you missed a spot, <laughs> and so and so that and so here we are. You know what I mean? But I, mm -hmm. I like to me, that's I'm just not really moved by things like that. You know what I'm saying? And I, actually, I've said it before. Um, people may remember when I was on um, the joint with with Jabari. Um, the whole I used to be a Christian thing. Like, I mean, that's cool. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I know quite frankly, most people that I that I run, run across who say that. Um, I haven't come across one, I guess, up until now, fanatic who can really articulate the Christian faith. Now I got to change that up. You know what I'm saying? But nevertheless, like, it doesn't move me, though. Like, that doesn't, you know, mean like, oh, man, well, you know, this guy used to be a Christian. Oh, man, you know, he studied it. You know, it's like, okay, and, you know, like, all right, cool, that's cool. But, and again, I understand he's just telling his own story, but I just don't think that that's anything that should shake somebody else. Like, you shouldn't be shaken by the fact that somebody else was involved for a long period of time and no longer is. Like, that doesn't, you know, whether, regardless of however long he was doing apologetics, doesn't mean that all of a sudden now the arguments and evidence that I put forward is somehow garbage now. Like, no, I, I still have reasons for what it is that I affirm. And that doesn't change just because somebody else is no longer affirming it. I mean, we, we have to stop connecting our own uh, convictions to the convictions of others. We got to stop doing that. You know what I mean? This is uh, something that we need to hold to because we hold to it. You know what I mean? Because we have good reason to. Yeah, it just makes yeah. it more tragic, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, here we go. Clip 11 here. Right. 30 years, um, you know, traveling the world, preaching to others, um, preaching to others what I, what I wholeheartedly believe. Perfect timing on that clip. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't have much more to say on it. I mean, just, uh, I just, again, I think that our conviction should be independent you know, from the next person sitting down the pew from us. I mean, like, it, it just doesn't, you know, work that way. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I'll move to the next clip. Unless you want to say something. We to... wholeheartedly still believe those things. And so it's not that we're, you know, massaging or lying or not recognizing reality of difficulties, but we still wholeheartedly believe those things. That's all. Yeah, simple as that. All right, here we go. And then you begin to see how interpretive decisions are made. You're looking at certain texts and you realize, oh, we could have translated this this way. We could have translated it this way. Why did we translate it this way and not that way? Well, we have theological commitments that help us translate it this way instead of that way. So, you mean, it could go the other way. Yeah, if we had different theological commitments. And as the issues begin to stack up, I just got to the point where I begin to feel like, okay, I believe what I believe. But like a Rubik's Cube, almost. Or maybe not a Rubik's Cube, because with a Rubik's Cube, you can configure it any way you want. There's really only one right way to do a Rubik's Cube. It's got all, all the same color on every side. But I begin to look at the faith and say, man, you could turn this Rubik's Cube any particular way and end up with a different understanding. And who can say that that understanding is right or that understanding is wrong? Mm. Rubik's Cube, the first Rubik's Cube analogy wasn't that bad. No, you can, you know, flip it any way. You can take off the stickers and cheat. <laughs> right. But at the, but that's there's not a thousand, you know, variations as far as it for for real, you know. And, and what's interesting, uh, compare, say, an Old Testament translation by some Protestants or something like that. Yeah. Um, maybe a broad, a wide ranging body of Protestants uh, to uh, say the Jewish Publication Society's English translation of the Tanakh. 
Um, you'll find some differences, and some of those have crept into Jewish translation, especially in the medieval era. When there was more counter-Christian polemics and whatnot due to certain pressures and, and things like that. And so, well, let's translate it in a way that's a little less uh, amenable to Christian understandings. But my point is, even if you do that, you're comparing Jewish Old Testament, Christian Old Testament, the differences are not massive. The differences are not massive, meaning I'm showing here. So here's these two different theological commitments. And you look at two sober translations, you grab that Old Testament, especially if it's in the Hebrew, but let's just say it's in English. Um, you can show Jesus as the Messiah from from that that Jewish publication society to knock. You can still show he's the Messiah. They may be put it Psalm 22, they pierced my feet and said they changed it to uh, something like, I think lions are at my feet, you know, uh, based upon some different understandings um, th there, but you can still, <laughs> Psalm 22 has still been understood to be a messianic Psalm, and it still sounds like Jesus Christ getting crucified. Micah 5, 2 still up in there. You know, there's there's a list, the, the whatever you do with Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin shall conceive, the fact is in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, before there was considerations of, oh, what about these Christians? It was translated into a more specific meaning in Greek that meant virgin versus just young handmaiden, which the Hebrew could go either way, but they translated it a more specific way when they put it to the Greek. So, you know, th that stuff's still all reality. I'm just saying uh it's not entirely true what he's saying but there's also sort of an overstatement but you had, you had a good point uh, in previous discussions about this yeah. about well okay of course yeah you know I, see, again this is one of those things man where you know i, I want to take people at their word but this is another one of those red flags where i have to question uh, it's going to be interesting what he has you know in some of his later discussions but it seems to me this is just another one of those points where he's putting and and um, an unfair uh, weight against you know the Christian or against Christianity, right. and applying it. And I, I'm just going to say it. I mean, it, 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 we'll see how it plays out in his later stuff. But it sounds akin to the special pleading fallacy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me explain what I mean by that. So what he said was, in regard to interpretations, let's say that you know somebody is translating a text. I'll put it that way. You know, or interpreting a text. I'll just say I'll just use the word that he used. Let's say somebody is interpreting some particular verse, and based upon the grammar and they get into the Greek and all these kind of things, you know, let's say you got like a 50-50, you know, in terms of how that verse should be interpreted, right? He's saying that, you know, there's he he implies, you know, there's something problematic, you know, about um, taking one interpretation over another because of your um theological presuppositions. He says, okay, we well, got the three th theological presuppositions, so we interpret it that way, you know, rather than than this way, you know what I'm saying? And he seems to <laughs> imply that 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 lends itself to there being some sort of un unhealthy bias, like intellectually dishonest bias that's driving the interpretation, or maybe it's just arbitrary, you know, there's no good reason, we're just going to kind of go with that. In either case, you know, that, that would be an issue. But I think that that's just, um, I don't, I don't mean to be like, you know, uh, I'm not trying to break the guy, but I, I just think that that's, I mean, it's silly. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just be straight up. I mean, that, that's, that's to me, I think that's silly. And here's the reason why I think that. Um, first of all, you have what's called the inference to the best explanation. I'm saying in any genre of academia, in any genre of study, I'm saying the inference to the best explanation is a type of inference that people make all the time. I'm saying they do it in academia. And they do it in in uh, and even in our everyday lives. I'll, I'll give a couple of different examples. So, by inference to the best explanation, what I'm saying is, if let's say if you have a verse and you're not really sure how it should be interpreted, right? But you're bringing some background now. So you have some some other theological commitments for which you do have strong arguments for which you do hold to on rational grounds. It is certainly appropriate then to take what you do know to inform you as you grapple with what it is that you that you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's nothing scandalous about taking theological presuppositions for which you have rational grounds to affirm and applying them as you work your way through a text and then um, looking for a coherence, you know, between, you know, what it is that you do know when you come to something that you don't know. Like, there's nothing scandalous about that. We do that all the time. You know what I'm saying? In any genre of, of, uh, of academia. So you know, let, let me give you an example. This, this is this is uh, I'm going to read you a quote. Um, this is from a, a gentleman named John Searle. Now, John Searle is a, a secular philosopher, is an atheist, 
doesn't believe in God. He believes that only the natural world exists. And this quote is him talking about um, how we can rule out there being, you know, um, some sort of a soul and things like that. This is kind of like just an, an excerpt, right? So listen to what he says. He says, every fact in the universe is in principle knowable and understandable by human investigators because reality is physical. And because science concerns the investigation of physical reality, and because there are no limits on what we can know of physical reality, it follows that all facts are knowable and understandable by us, meaning human beings, end quote. Okay, so essentially what he says is because everything is everything exists in the physical reality and we're able to study physical reality through the sciences, then everything is knowable to us. You know what I'm saying? In, in principle, everything is knowable to us. But notice his conclusion that everything is knowable to us is predicated on the idea that everything that exists is in the physical realm, is everything is physical. So in terms of wrestling with what it is that we can know about the universe or what it is that we can know about anything, right? He's employing and factoring in his theological presupposition, which is there's mm -hmm. no God and there's nothing outside of the physical realm, right? He's using what he, what he believes he has good reason to affirm and factoring that in as he's trying to answer another question. So that's that's when you, that's uh, atheist who deals with philosophy of mind. Again, that's John Searle. You know, that's that's not a Christian doing that. That's just in, in what he believes to be the inference to the best explanation. We do that literally all the time. You know what I'm saying? And so, oh, shoot, I knocked my headphones out. So hype, yeah. I knocked my headphones out. You know? When you're uh, ready, I want to show so, uh, I want to show looks like, an example. OK, cool. Let, let me just sum this up right quick just to make sure I'm clear, you know, but. Ultimately, what I'm saying is when you apply the inference to the best explanation to, you know, uh, either translating a text or interpreting a text, what that looks like would be taking things that you have good reason to affirm theologically and then factoring them in as you work your way through a text that you're trying to discern what the meaning is. That's there's nothing scandalous about that. That's literally inference we make all the time. I'll come back to it. But you, you want to give an example? Did you is my screen sharing? Is it no, you know, it's not excellent. It's I'm not trying to thing. share. Okay, here we go. What about now? Uh, no. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. Follow these steps. Hey, what happened? Oh, <laughs> snap. Uh, Come on, Vocab. You're supposed to be a professional YouTuber, man. Come on, man. Dang it, man. Um, hold on now. Let me. Um, why are you pulling that? Well, you actually, why are you pulling that up? Like, if I send you uh, the text, can you like just bring it up? Can you like put yeah, text you, on yeah, the screen? If you email it to me, yeah. Okay. Is it like a slide or something like that? Or? Like, what if I put it in the chat? No, it's like actual text, but it's Greek. What if I do this? Could you oh, yeah, just put it in the private chat? Like, is that possible? Yeah. I just sent you something. All right. Give me but uh, I'm going to try. Where'd you send it? Uh, it's in the private chat. Right here on StreamYard. Okay. I got to uh, see. Why is it let me... Uh... I can't Shoot. get to the private chat. Man, we're, we're terrible. I can't get to the private chat, bro. Share screen. <laughs> I've tried to. Oh, oh, my bad. I was clicking on the wrong thing. Here we go. Um, give me one second. I'll cut and paste it to something else, and then I'll be able to That's share messed up, the man. screen. Man, sorry. I, uh, this is going to be a, a cool thing, you know? Yeah, you mess, you're messing up, bro. All right, here we go. I mean, um... If you can't get it, I'll just I'll forget it. I'll just, but if you if you can't, give me one second. I'm a, I just gotta enlarge the screen. All right, I think I can do it now. <laughs> yeah, we man. are we are professionals, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. I don't know why I've lost permission to do it. This it was gonna be cool. It was right, a perfect go. perfect example. Boom. How's that? Oh wait. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, if you can make make it uh, bigger, but. Okay. Let me let me show something here to everyone there. So uh, th I think this will hopefully be helpful. So what I sent Adam uh, is John chapter one. I sent Adam John chapter one, the text for it in Greek, um, <clears throat> up to verse five. Can you uh, separate that English? Get rid of the English. It's like blocking. It's, it's, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Where it says Kurt Alon, because that's just the information. I don't know if you can get rid of it. That's just the information for the, get rid of this. Yeah, yeah, or some, or just space it down. Okay, there we go. So let's look here. Can you put the cursor on the first line and then go along? So in arche in ha lagos, kai ha lagos in pros tan theon, 
Kai, Theos, and Ha Lagos. Okay, that's what that first line. That's how that's how it sounds out. You probably recognize some of those words, everybody. And let me let me show you something that's an example of what he might say, but why it makes total, perfect, complete sense to translate it according to a larger theological understanding. So, can if you can uh, put your cursor on uh, after the. Um, Let's see if you could put it right. Do you see the first time there's Theon? It, it, it's like at the uh, – it's in the first line, the second to last word from the right. Go to the top. Right there. Yeah, yeah. That says Theon. That, that means God. Theos is God, but it's inflected here. And so it's Theon, okay? And uh, right before it, can you highlight the next thing? It says Tan. And right before that, it says Pros. That is with the God or face to face with the God. Pros is like facing towards type of thing. Ton is is uh, basically the, uh, what's called a definite article. And Theon, Theon in this context uh, is, is God, uh, the, the one true God, because it actually even puts the God, which is fascinating, right? Now, the God doesn't translate into English. In English, it's and the word was with God. It doesn't say in the word was with the God. So the definite article is actually left out in our English translations because in English, we don't usually do that. One way you can essentially get at the same idea, for example, is to capitalize the G. Now, they don't have capitalization in the same way uh, The same the same way for this. They, they have lowercase and uppercase, but it's sort of a different thing going on here as far as the convention. But m- watch this. W- with the God, Tan. Uh, focus on that. We're right where Adam's cursor is. That is the. That basically is, translates as the definite article. So the God. Now I want to show you the next line. Can you highlight the the last half of the first, just the verse, not the whole line, but from Kai. You see the Kai, the conjunction there in the top. Can you highlight that all the way to the end where the asterisk is? Uh, there you go. Kai theos in halagas. So Kai is a conjunction. It just means and. And God, Theos, in Ha, that there's a breathing mark over what looks like an O. That's Ha, that also means the, the Lagos. And God was the Lagos. That's what it literally says. And God was the Lagos. Notice what is missing before the Theos. It's in Theon there, but it's the same root word. Before God, what is missing, if you want to put it that way, in this use of the word God, Adam, what's not there? The definite article. Oh, sorry, your mic's muted. There's no definite article before this use of God. Well, that's fascinating. What happened to the definite article? Why isn't there a definite article? But there is a definite article before Lagos. Why is there a definite article before Lagos, but not before Theos, when it's both mean God and it's being used right there? Here's what's going on, and here I'm going to show you how this is relevant in a second. Basically, this translates as, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. Because this is showing, here's God, here's the Word, theos, logos. But to denote the similarity yet the distinction, the similarity is that both are God. This is, this is, this is an element of Trinitarianism, what's called Benitarianism, father and son relationship. Both are God. But the father, so the one not described as Lagos, gets the definite article. But the one described as Lagos, and later on, if you go down to John 1.14, clearly is Jesus, doesn't have the definite article here. So what should you do with that theos, that use of God? Should you also – should you understand it as the one true God? But the the definite article is not there. But guess what else is not there? The indefinite article is not there. It doesn't say a or an. Jehovah's Witnesses, though, recognizing that in Greek, if you don't have a definite article listed, sometimes in English, that means it, an indefinite article ends up going before the noun. So they have it as, and the word was a god. Strictly speaking on a grammatical level, that is possible. 
because there are contexts where if you don't have in Greek the definite article, you can you you need or require it sometimes in the English translation for it to make sense because it's clear it's it's it would end up being an indefinite article in English because that's the way it's, it's understood. So that's the way it would need to be translated into the receptor language. So strictly, if this is all you're looking at. It's possible. It doesn't mean it's even required, even on that consideration alone. Because just like the definite article is left out, even though it's there, you don't, you don't need to add an indefinite article when there's nothing there. But it's possible that that could happen. But why do we not do that? Why are the Jehovah's Witnesses wrong to put a God? Because of the book of John's theology. Because you clearly know he's imitating echoing Genesis 1-1 here, first of all, in the beginning. Clearly, he's opening it with Genesis ringing in his ears, and he wants that to happen to you too. Genesis 1 is describing monotheism, a one true God. But you don't even need that. You just got to read the rest of the book of John, and it's clear it's within a Hebraic monotheistic context, and the, the reality of one God is affirmed in John's gospel. And if we say not only that, but what about it? Let's say you don't want to take it out to the books of the New Testament because you don't think they belong together. If you think John wrote anything else, you could take it out of his writings. But let's say you don't know who the, you say you don't know who the author of this is. If you just take this as a document just from there and have that as your main con consideration is the internal consistency of it. It would be inconsistent at that point to have a God. It would be not just, oh, it could go either way. It would not be right because it's clear there's not another God being described there. Remember, it's not required. I'm just saying it's grammatically possible. This is a perfect example where the theological background should inform the translation. Because all you're doing is you're taking out and you're saying, well, this is a monotheistic writer in a monotheistic culture affirming monotheism in his gospel, which which promotes monotheism, albeit ultimately I would say a Trinitarian monotheism, at least a Binitarian monotheism. Andreas Kostenberger has a great book about that. But here's the point. That's an example. I knew that took a little bit, but I hope people can see that. He's saying that, but I wanted to show an example where, okay, on the surface of it, that's literally true what he's saying but is it a bad thing no it's a good thing it's the way you should do your translation that's why the a god translation is not really it's not accepted even by sort of what are liberal translations like the the nrsv which is sort of like the world council of churches type of translation they don't they, they know that that's not right they don't they don't they don't have they don't have they wouldn't have something like that all of a sudden look we've got a polytheism or 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 that in this situation don't have that so what's fascinating about this passage is if god wanted to describe two persons who are both god God, he did it the best way, which is like the perfect way you could do it in Greek. And I, that's that one good. example. I just had to break that down. Thank you. No, no, that's good. And so, so I want to bring it down a, a level too, because I, I, I want people to really get what you just said, because I feel like it's pretty, that's pretty crucial. I'm gonna take this off the screen. So to, to bring it down to every day, right? So let, let's say that me and my wife, I just have to run to the store. Okay. Again, this is just talking about the, the inference is the best explanation. You just showed it, how it, how it applies to, you know, theology and translation, right? But if you look at it, well, let me just put it this way. Let's say I'm going to the store, right? I'm like, babe, I'm going to the store and um, I'm gonna get some ice cream or something like that, you know? And let's say that she's like, okay, you know, I ask her, let's say if I ask her, you know, what, what do you want? She's like, I just give me something that you know I like, right? Now, let's say that I know that my wife is allergic to, to chocolate, right? She can't have chocolate, she like breaks out in the hives or, or whatever people who are allergic to chocolate break out in, right? And so I go to the store, I come back, and I got her some chocolate ice cream. She would be like, why, what, you know, why did you give me chocolate ice cream? You know that I'm allergic to chocolate ice cream, right? If I have a choice between chocolate ice cream, which I know she's allergic to, and something else that I know she would like, it wouldn't be rational for me to choose the chocolate ice cream. I wouldn't want to bring that home, given my background knowledge about my wife and, mm -hmm. and what her preferences are in, in her situation, right? Likewise, you know, that's, that's a rational inference. I'm saying it's rational for me to pick something else. Likewise, when I'm sitting down with John 1 1 and I come to you know that that passage, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to understand what's what, what's rational, um, what's the rational way to understand what he's saying here. And I can look at the remainder of his book and I see this high Christology, I see you know him, him proclaiming monotheism, so on and so forth. I know what he thinks about it, right? Is it rational for me then to take that into account as I interpret John 1 1? Of course it is. Of course it is, right? 
this I mean, we literally do this with everything all the time. You know, so my whole point in bringing that out is that when Brady leverages that and implies that there's some sort of illicit bias going on in terms of rotation or in terms of interpretation or some kind of um, intellectual dishonesty, you know, when people interpret based upon theological theological commitments, I think what he's doing there, I think that he's putting a standard on those theologians or translators that we don't put on anybody else. I'm saying like we, we, I mean, he, he's basically charging them for doing something wrong. That is a this like standard practice in academia, and regardless of what genre uh, of uh, study you're in, and it's an inference that we use all the time. You know what I'm saying? So, to me, I'm wondering, you know, like like what's up with that? You know what I mean? Like I I wonder if that's going to be the critiques that he has coming forth. I wonder if we're going to uh, see some kind of consistent. Um, again, applying some sort of uh, standard to Christians and theologians that is um, ultimately, I would say, irrational. It's essentially a case of a special plea. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, 100 percent. And uh, yeah. there's even an example, um, you know, like in John 5, 44, for example. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Yeah. So G, that's a quote from Jesus. And before he says theu in that context, which is the root of that, again, is theos, God. Before that, he says manu, which means only or unique. So Jesus is, he even says that, you know, the, the only God. So it's clear it's a monotheistic context. And there's other examples there. But, but I think it's important that, you know, John affirms the monotheism of the Old Testament and yet wrote that. It's fascinating. You know, I was debating whether I was going to go here now, but I'm going to just nerd out for a second. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and do it because I created the slide. So, <laughs> so I just because just I, I want to go ahead and uh, do this right. Give, give me one second. I want to share something here. Oh, uh, shoot. Let me, let me bring this up. Because, I again, helpful, people. You said what? I just said I hope that's uh, was helpful to people. And that took a little time, but. I hope because, you know, he mentioned translation. He didn't give any examples. I was like, well, let me give an example where you have sort of another consideration and how you end up translating as something. And there's also illicit examples of that. You know, we didn't go to it. We're not going to. I'm just doing this while Adam gets up his slide. Colossians 1.15, it says that Christ created all things, you know, and that whole mm -hmm. section about the supremacy of Christ, Colossians 1.15 through 20. The Jehovah's Witness use an illicit use of theological background to misinterpret at the New World Translation, Colossians 1.15. They literally insert, and they, they now bracket it, I believe, in their translations, the word other. Jesus uh, basically created all other things. Why do they have to do that? Because on their theology, he would himself was created, so he can't create all things. If he himself is created, so it's all other things. But the Greek word for other, if you, and you can have their interlinear. I have their interlinear out there on the shelf. Their interlinear doesn't have the Greek word other. It doesn't have it because it's not in a Greek text, yet they just put it there in English, changes the meaning of it because of an illicit theological background, and they use an illicit theological background to, to create an illicit translation. That's it. That'd be a bad example of that. But that's not right, what's right. going on, and if, unless he wants to give some specific examples. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes from that. You know, uh, I'll make this make this real quick. And again, my beef here is my red flag is that I, it seems to me that he's applying a standard to Christians and, and you know, implying that there's some dishonesty or, or wrongful uh, or intellectually yeah. dishonest bias when I think he's made a, a he's levied the charge is this unjustified. And, and it's unjustified because the inference that he's talking about or that he described is something we see in academia all the time and in everyday life. So he's, he's a basic real quick uh slide like five seconds ago before <laughs> before we went live um it's, you know essentially just noetic structure right and that's just a really fancy way of talking about how like the structure of our beliefs like if you can imagine each one of your beliefs everything that you and by belief i mean something you affirm to be true everything that you affirm to be true is kind of like a house all right and it has pieces to it i'm saying and those pieces just like you have a house you got like a roof and you got the like the walls and you got like a foundation your beliefs are kind of like that. OK, so, you know, in, in order for me to believe that uh, today is uh, that what is today? Today's, you know, Wednesday. Right. Uh, I first need to know, like, what is a day? You know what I'm saying like there, I need to believe there's there's in order for me to understand, like, what Wednesday is. I need to know something about, like, what a day is you know what I'm saying, like kind of with that period of time. In other words, our beliefs connect with each other in that sort of a way. And so if you look at this picture here, what I have 
instead of the word belief, I, I use kind of a I, I have the word prop here, which is short for proposition. But you you said that I would just say, you know, beliefs. So let's say all you know, you got four and five there. Those are like, you know, things that you believe about the world, you know. Ultimately, underneath those things that you believe about the world are more basic things. And that's kind of what was represented there in Proposition 1, 2, and 3. You know I'm saying? So it's like our beliefs are like stacked on top of each other. You know, again, like I use the example, um, you know, there's things that we believe like, you know, today is Wednesday. I need to know what like a day is. And what does the word today mean? You know what I'm saying in order for me to understand the sentence today is Wednesday, I need to know that, you know, there's a such thing as a day. I need to know what today means. And I need to know what, what Wednesday means. Right. So in a sense, you know, we have these beliefs and they're stacked upon each other. But then if you keep going far, far enough down, eventually you get to everybody's got like a foundational layer of beliefs that we hold to that are not on the basis of other beliefs. And we might call those things properly basic beliefs or foundational beliefs. So, for example, I don't believe that um, if I were to tell you that the, the, the universe in, in its entirety is, is only five minutes old. You know what I'm saying? It just popped into being five minutes ago. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it just has the appearance of age and, you know, the meal that you just ate is in your stomach. It's, it's all just manufactured. It all just popped into existence five minutes ago. Now, there's really no non-circular way that you could argue against that statement. You know what I'm saying? Nevertheless, we understand that that's probably not the case. It's probably not true that the universe you know, was created, was just popped into being like five minutes ago. And we're rational for not believing that. You know what I'm saying? even though we can't argue it on the basis of some other belief, because anything that we appeal to would be something like within the universe or within our realm of experience, you know what I'm saying? And it become, becomes circular. So we have a properly basic belief that the past is indeed real, you know, that you know this, everything didn't pop into being five minutes ago. I have a foundational belief that I exist, you know what I'm saying? I, I believe that the external world exists. I believe that you know, when I'm talking to Vocab Malone, I don't think that it's a projection of my mind. I have a rational belief um that vocab indeed exists now if i want to be like super skeptical i could argue that you know nothing exists except for me in my mind i could be a, you know what someone called like a solipsist you know what i'm saying but nevertheless we're rational for affirming that things in the external world do indeed exist even though we don't do so on the basis of like some other belief in some non-circular way i said all that to say his idea of that there being something wrong with making a determination about a text based on other beliefs that one brings into, into, the, into account, other theological uh, commitments, that's, you know, there's nothing illicit about it. And it's, it's literally how all of our thinking works. It's, it's literally how everything, just about everything that you believe is on the basis of some other beliefs. That's just how, that's just basic epistemology. That's how our thoughts and beliefs fit together. And so again, when it comes to how thoughts and how epistemology works, I'm saying how our thinking works, um, and when it comes to how, no matter what genre of study you're in, you know what I'm saying? Uh, when it comes to how, you know, people make inferences about what they believe to be true, as I read like with John Searle for a second ago, or in terms of how we make decisions on, on navigating everyday life, on those three levels, the inference that Brady attributes as being problematic to Christians, that's something that's literally just part of everyday life. And so to me, even though it sounds cute, it just doesn't really hold water when you hold it under scrutiny because I, I would wonder why um someone as well studied as he is would make kind of that, that kind of a sloppy mistake you know and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about that and i feel like it's going to come up time and time again yeah cool i told you i had to nerd out there for a second but kind of that's all right man what else we got i think we got like three or four clips left yeah something like that yeah uh, I, I lost track of where I was at, so I'm just going to pick it up. The issues begin to, to stack up, and as the issues begin to stack up, I got to the point where I began to feel like I was, one, being lied to, and two, being trained to lie to other people, and not lie in a malevolent way, but it just seemed like everywhere I turned, there was another, well, here's how we get over this hurdle. And here's how we get over that hurdle. And here's how we get around this problem. And here's how we. Mm -mm -mm. Hmm. I mean, he, he doesn't want to say it. So he kind of, but he massages it, but he's saying I was being lied to and being trained to lie to others, basically. Yeah. And you know, that's where, at one point, I could say, okay, it sounds like he's just talking to people who don't hold to the faith 
but they and they hold these mental reservations and they're still in these spaces where it appears they hold of the faith. But there it doesn't seem like that's what he's doing. He it seems like he's talking about confessional Christians and he's being lied to by them. Unless he's just saying they're lying about what they believe, but it seems like it's more than that because he's saying and being trained essentially to lie to others. So, like, that's now his view of apologetics, which, my goodness, if you listen to the hardcore faction of the Internet atheists, that's all they think apologetics is, is being trained how to, to con people and to lie to them. <laughs> right. Like, I remember Robert Price, uh, wanted a, he made a joke one time. Robert Price said, I'm going to make a response book to the book by Geisler. In Turek, which is I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and I'm going to call it I don't have enough gall to be an apologist, right? And and the idea was like you know these dudes are just trained liars. That's that's all that's really going on. I mean, I'm not saying he's all the way there, but he's like it seems like dangerously close. Like it seems like the tepid version of that. Like, well, hold, hold up, bro. Okay, I mean, you're saying you were going to die for this faith, you really believed it, but you're being lied to and being taught how to lie to others. That's your apologetic training. That's what they were doing yeah. at Westminster. That's the way you view it now. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I, I kind of, he, he does. I'm kind of getting the vibe of like a type of hyper skepticism. You know I'm saying, and by hyper skepticism, I mean the kind where there's, there's nothing wrong with being like a critical thinker where you challenge yourself. You know I'm saying, like skepticism right. in that sense, I think can can be healthy. But I think that you know, Christian or not, I think that you can be a skeptic to the point where you end up undercutting you know, what's rational, like what you could rationally hold. And that's what I mean by hyper skepticism. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, it'd be interesting to see as, you know, kind of time goes on, if, if that's what, you know, starts kind of seeping out of them. But I, I suspect that there's some, uh, some inklings of it there, you know, mm -hmm. All right, let me keep going. I don't know if I skipped 12 or not, I'm going to just play it just in case. Let me see. And then you begin to see how interpretive decisions are made. You look okay, I already played that, my bad. Mm -hmm. My bad. And it was a heavy, heavy letter because, as I said in the letter, I was not just withdrawing my membership from this local body. Uh, it's actually the, the universal church that I said, you know what? I really can't amen what I used to amen. Oh, okay. We kind of covered that already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is another part of him just... Uh denouncing the faith unfortunately there's one of these that's and uh, I kind spent of this long. next several years after seminary this is it. adam th just uh, you might want to stop this one throughout it i think this okay. is like, this may be the last clip or second to last clip this second is, to the last yeah. yeah this is the longest one i don't know if you want to it's like five minutes i think total yeah this is the one where you sent it to me it took me like 15 minutes to download by the way but yeah, yeah thanks you know. <laughs> you, know, you know all right so yeah just let me know if you want to stop it somewhere or make a particular point yeah. Yeah. Rubik's cubing God's world, trying to see God in his world instead of just in his word. And uh, I even began to teach like I wanted to teach in secular academia, but it was my passion had been taking my, uh, my theological worldview, my cultural experience, my sociology, my philosophy, my psychology, all the different disciplines that I had been trained in or lived through and merging them into one curriculum. And that's what I did with my classes, my hip hop and uh, hip hop history and ethics classes. That's what I was doing. And still wanting people to come to the cross, still believing the gospel, but also still having some very fundamental questions about our documentary faith. I even began to teach at Christian universities teaching classes on apologetics, how to defend the faith. And I remember standing in front of classes thinking, I'm giving them these, these pat answers, but if these students knew what I knew, they would ask me certain questions that would, that would change this dynamic. Um, and so even while I was trying to prepare them to run into skeptics, I'm also in my own mind very skeptical of what I'm saying. Um, I'm, I'm going to just pause it right there, like, because it's about a fourth of the way through. Like, we, you know, I have something I want to say there, but, you know, what are your thoughts on that so far? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah. The only thing I bring out there is I didn't catch this before. He said, our documentary faith. 
that's interesting because it seems like a lot of this he mentioned inerrancy we didn't play the clip uh but uh that makes me wonder if like it he's gonna ultimately put it sort of on the problems with what he perceives as problems with the bible because he, he said our documentary faith you see what i'm saying uh th that's what i yeah I mean, and, that's what it seems like and i think you can kind of glean that from his posts over the last couple of months as well mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying that you know he definitely um i mean he says right you know in the video he doesn't believe that the bible is true and i think that um I suspect he'll probably try to come from like a textual criticism, Old Testament critique, you know, type of a vantage point to, uh, you know, leverage it that way. Uh, but I, I just thought it was interesting, like, you know, again, um, I, I don't know what his experiences were. I mean, I mean, I, I can't tell him what he experienced, you know, in academia or, um, you know, as he was teaching. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I may have said this before. I mean, I, I argue, argue against myself all the time. I mean, I think it's okay to challenge yourself. I don't think there's anything illicit, you know, illicit about that at all. But I find it interesting that um, um, I kind of hope that that he brings that out, like you know, what, what those those struggles were. You know what I mean, because it, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what exactly you know kind of kind of tripped him up. I mean, obviously he's kind of vague here, you know, what I'm saying, but it, it'd be interesting to see kind of where where he lands with that. You know, Adam, when you um are you with yourself? Do you go like this a lot? Well, because <laughs> whenever you argue with Adam, if you don't agree with him, when you're saying what he, you say, he always goes, well. <laughs> no, I do. I, I do actually. Well. You know what I'm saying? No, but seriously, because here's the thing. And I, I don't often say this, but like, I don't buy all, like, all the arguments that some apologists make. And I'm not trying to be disparaging, but some of them, I, I, you know, they're not convincing to me. And so I don't make those arguments. You're saying like, you know, there, there's some arguments. Well, if I don't feel like it's a particularly strong one, then I don't employ it when I'm dealing with other people. And I think I do think that that's intellectually honest, actually. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wouldn't make an argument that I don't feel is all that strong. So, you know, but nevertheless, you know, I just I ain't gonna lie, I, I'm just kind of skeptical. You know, he says that, oh, well, you know, if I made this argument, if you knew, you know, what I know, then you would say this, this and this, you know, and um. But you know, Brady, I, I there just, are people who know what you know. That's my point. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I just, I, you know, here's, here's the thing. There, I know people personally, you know what I'm saying, who engage these things on a very high level. And perhaps, you know, Brady has, has debunked all of, you know, you know, apologetics argumentation. Perhaps that's the case. That's a pretty tall order, you know, and I'm pretty skeptical that, he, that he's done that. Um, because I think that, I mean, just so put a per perfect example, right? There's a guy... Um, you know, I'm not even going to put that out there. I'll just say that, you know, when it comes to like the cosmological argument, you know, I've read a lot about it. I've, I've written on it, you know what I'm saying, at, at this point, you know, and there's tons of stuff that I don't even know about. There's ins and outs. Like you could literally study one argument for God's existence for a lifetime and still not get all the contours of it. You know what I'm saying? I think about somebody like uh, Dave Baggett, for example, you know what I'm saying, who's spent his whole life dealing with like the moral argument. And different variations of it and ways that you can you know approach it from you know maybe moral knowledge or or maybe um uh or versus an ontological approach and things like that you know the shame versus you know um uh you know, being praiseworthy for things i mean he just attacked it from like a million to one different angles that's what he spent his whole life doing you know so i'm i'm sorry i just i just really I'm skeptical, you know what I'm saying, of his skepticism. I'm, I'm skeptical that somehow he's managed to, you know, um, just just un, unravel, you know, all the arguments he's come across. Hey, maybe maybe you'll prove me wrong. You know, I seriously doubt it. You know, it'd be interesting to see him try it, but it, it, yeah, I seriously doubt that's the case. All right. Oh, yeah, my fault. Dang. I didn't mean to take that off. Oops. Changing the Rubik's Cube and dealing with the, the tension in my heart and in my mind of, but you know this can go another way. You know this can be seen, and you know there, there are whole groups of people who see this another way. Um, fast forward, I had some, from some really good friends in a uh, accountability group that I've been meeting with for five, six years now. Some of these brothers were like, I think you might be depressed. And I brushed it off like, me depressed? Nah, nah. Everything was going good, like, you know, income, relationships, family, everything was cool. Why am I depressed? But a couple more years go by and it's even deeper and 
my man brought it back up like yo have you ever re-engaged in the scriptures since seminary you said you needed to see god in his world not just in his word i was like nah you know what not in any real way not aside from my little small devotionals here and there but not like really diving back in because i was i was afraid of what i would find if i dove back into the scriptures i, I might find something else that would I literally told God, like, if I find one more thing in the scriptures that doesn't have a good explanation without resorting to some kind of having to bend over backwards and hop over barrels to explain it, I said, I might lose my faith. But when my man challenged me, I said, nah, you know what? I never have. Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going to dive back in. And the next day I did, I woke up and I dove headfirst into the scriptures. And, um... It was weird because I'm reading it and all these issues are jumping out of me. Issues I never saw before. I'm like, yo, who put that in the Bible? Like, when, where'd that come from? No, that's that's been there. Why am I just now seeing this issue? I don't know what I had been doing in the past. Like, I hadn't, I'd never seen this issue. I'd never seen that problem. And it was just jumping out at me. I said, what, what's going on? Next day, I went back, dove back in, and even more issues. I said, oh, wait. I had, I had actually blocked and blacked out the issues that I had been struggling with for all those years. Um, and I had forgotten what they were. But now that I'm diving back into the scriptures, now they're jumping out at me. And I realized what had happened in those, those five or six years since seminary when I wasn't living in the text. All my presuppositions had fallen off. All of the things that I used to, almost like the armor that I had that helped me to bulldoze my way through issues in the text, all that stuff had fallen off. The things that I, I, I used to, it had become second nature for me to do to kind of zigzag my way through the issues in the text. All those tools were gone and I'm just sitting there now with just me and the text and those issues. That's telling. Uh, you're muted. You're muted, brother. Brother, you're muted. I was saying, yeah, this, this for me, like, I think I've, out of everything that you said, I feel like this was most most telling. Because, and, and this is not a criticism. I'm just saying, like, I think, you know, we have to look at people um, as people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he, he's not just a brain you know, and, you know, faced with a bunch of facts and now he, he's changed his mind on something just like anybody else. He, he's a person and his transition away from Christianity didn't happen like in an intellectual vacuum. Right. I feel like what he's given here in this clip is there's there's a context that, that ventures beyond just intellectual concerns that seems to be the backdrop of, you know, where where how he got to where he is now, because when you hear him talk, you know, he encountered some things in college, uh, seminary, or whatever, um, that had him thinking you know, a little bit different. And whatever it was jarred him so much that he, he hadn't seriously engaged in, in reading the scriptures for about five, five or six years. You know, he said maybe some devotionals or whatever. But as far as seriously, or what he described, like really getting in the text, it had been about five or six years. Right. And in that same amount of time, you can't tell me he's not reading anything. I mean, he's a very intellectual guy. So I'm sure he's reading something, yep. right? Um, so, like I said last night, I, I would wonder what he was feeding himself during that time, intellectually speaking, you know. But aside from that, though, here you have this drift away from reading the scriptures, coupled with, you know, would he at least somebody in this circle describe as being depression? And if I'm understanding him correctly, you know, initially he kind of rejected that idea, but it seems like he, you know, Perhaps, you know, that there was something in the mix. You know, it seems like he, he implied, if I understood correctly, that indeed maybe he was battling with some some uh, level of depression. But nevertheless, you know, you have this, you know, what may have been perceived as, as depression also kind of paralleling whatever's going on with him in terms of, you know, not reading the scriptures and so on and so forth. So I said that to say, you know, yeah, while I do, you know, take his intellectual concerns, you know, seriously. I mean, I think that you know they, they're worthy of considering and being responded to. Nevertheless, like we can't act like, you know, people ain't people. You know, there's more going on with, with Brady Goodwin than just I'm just this really smart guy that saw some falsehoods and now I'm trying to make a switch. No, there's 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 a whole life here going on. Yeah, we're not that's, brains that's on the, we're not brains on a stick. No, we're really not. You know what I'm saying? And I think 
to me, true bravery would be to, and, and perhaps he'll do this. And it's not to say, I mean, you can't put all your business out to the world, but at least in his own time, I think true bravery would necessitate that you be intellectually honest enough with yourself to say, you know what, it's not true that I just made a switch because I'm super smart and I found out that this stuff was wrong. You know, let's at least be honest that, you know, there's some other factors here of an emotional sort, um, at least, you know, that, that's weighing in. Last thing I'm going to say is this, um, and this is something I talked about last night, is that when it comes to the, the biblical worldview and lifestyle, you know, guys, this is not just about, you know, uh, what we can call propositional knowledge. There's different types of knowledge. You know what I'm saying? I'm not speaking just as a Christian, but philosophically, there's at least three types of knowledge. And I think I'm just going to go ahead and do a whole teaching on this because I don't want to get into it all now. We've already been here for like two hours. But, you know, to, to put it simply, um, there's at least three forms of knowledge acknowledged by, you know, philosophers and whatnot who study these kind of things. And they would be, um, we might call experiential or uh, experiential knowledge or knowledge of by acquaintance. You know, that's kind of like direct awareness of things. Like, you know, I can see this, you know, this red cup right here and you know, I have direct awareness of it. Um, stuff like that, you know, you know, experiential knowledge. Then you have procedural knowledge. And that's kind of like know-how kind of knowledge. Like I know how to shoot a basketball. I know how to ride a bike. It's, you know, like an acquired skill kind of a knowledge. You know how right? to root for losing football teams. <laughs> there we go. You're great, you're great at it. But so does Damon Richardson. Oh, because the Cowboys lost anyway, but um, but then you also have uh, so you got you have experiential knowledge, or we might call it knowledge by acquaintance. You have um, procedural knowledge, which is know how, and then you have propositional knowledge. That's kind of like what we might call like head knowledge, you know, knowledge of facts and things like that. Okay, now when it comes to the biblical worldview, the biblical lifestyle, you know, there's there should be a coherence between all three. There should be a healthy balance and coherence between all three types of knowledge. That's what Scripture. You know, brings to us. I'm saying so. For example, um, you know, I'll start with the uh, the propositional. Right? There are certain things that um, it, to have a healthy Christian life, you ought to know about Christianity. You know, what I'm saying like if I come to you and say that um, you know that that Jesus Jesus and Buddha are the same person or something like that, you know, that I'm factually incorrect about that. That's that's factually incorrect. That's that's not Christianity. There's certain things I need to know. Or if I think about like uh, John chapter 17, verse three, where it talks about, you know, this is eternal life, that you will know the true God and Jesus whom you've sent. Well, if if eternal life hinges upon knowing the true God and I have a, and I have a God's concept that is not consistent with the God that was revealed, you know, ultimately by Jesus Christ and then also through the scriptures, then I can't say that I, you know, know the true God, you know, the, as mentioned in John uh, 17 and 3. There's certain things I need to know about God. I'm saying that uh, he, he's omniscient. I can derive that from the text. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Those kind of things. Like, these are things that are true about God. That, well, they're either true or false. And if you don't know them, then that impacts how it is that you relate to this God that you claim to know, right? So that's propositionalized, but then also procedural. You know, everything is not just what you know, but it's putting these things into practice, man. You know what I'm saying? Jesus said, he, he says, look, you know, men ought to always pray. You know, Matthew uh, chapter six, it talks about, you know, when you give charitably, when you pray, when you fast. You know, it's, it's, there's these practices that come along with being a Christian, being a disciple, I should say. You know what I mean? Um, you know, worshiping God, you know, those, those sort of things, those spiritual disciplines that's packaged into the life of the believer. Right. So it's not enough just to have the propositional knowledge, but scripture also commends to us. There's this procedural part. There's this skill building, I mean, even on a moral level, you know, developing the skill of being morally mature and things of that nature. You know, that's, that's what we're called to do. Renewing your mind, things of that nature. There's a skill involved. Um, and then lastly, there's the experiential, experiential part, right? And I can go a lot of different directions with this, but to keep it basic, you know, you can know that God exists based upon the witness of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying that you know, it's going to get into reformed epistemology. I don't want to go too far afield. But, you know, the, the scripture commends us that we have the, the spirit within us that, that cries out, Abba, Father, for example. You know what I'm saying? That you know, the, the spirit of God has been shed abroad in our hearts and so on and so forth. There's like this direct experience aspect of the biblical worldview and the Christian walk. Um, you know, it talks about how... Um, 
even matter of fact, even unbelievers can 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 know that God exists and they can know something about his nature based on Romans one uh, that, that you quoted earlier. You know, the, uh, the scriptures commend to us that we have fellowship with our father, with, with the father and, and the son, Jesus Christ. You know I'm saying like that, that Konania, you know, that's what the word fellowship is there. So you have this experience. You also have the procedural knowledge. You also have the propositional. All these things fit into the life of the believer. I said that to say if you're really top heavy you know, on the propositional knowledge and you you skip the leg day and kind of use the gym gym analogy, even though I'll be going to the gym like that, like I should. But if you're really top heavy, you know what I'm saying, when it comes to propositional knowledge, but you're skip you're skipping leg day when it comes to getting in the scriptures for real or, you know, various types of self-care that might, you know, help when it comes to, you know, depression and so on and so forth. You know, um, when you're skipping leg day, when it comes to the experiential and the procedural, uh, then, yeah, the propositional knowledge is not going to hold you because that's just not the way that the, the life of the disciple was designed to be. You know what I'm saying? So I think that what I'm seeing, is, I think is interesting that when he says that he stopped reading the Bible for five or six years and, you know, it sounds like that's some some procedural knowledge that, that kind of, you know, f- fell out of, out of the way there. You know what I'm saying? When he, when he talks about, you know, being, there being this, this depression there, I'm certainly not one having suffered from depression, you know, um, about to depression, I'll say at various points in my life, I'm certainly not one to condemn anybody for that. That's a very real thing. That being said, again, you know, we shouldn't think that, you know, that is somehow independent from, you know, where he is now. You know I'm saying I think that the, the procedural, the experiential also informs, or I should say um, shapes the, the outcomes, you know, not just the propositional. That's good, man. Breaking it down. Put out that video, son. Yeah, I'm gonna do it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do it, you know, because I think that um, it's especially easy, you know. I think in in our you know in our circles to harp on the proceed the, the propositional knowledge that, that head knowledge, right? But but just think about this, right? So Jesus says, you know, um, actually, I, I think I got it right, right here in my notes. Give me one second. All right. Give me one second here. By the way, for uh, Christian books on some of what we've been saying, here's one I'd recommend, Epistemology by W.J. Wood, Becoming Intellectually Virtuous. He breaks down some of the different theories of epistemology and how do we know what we know, whether you agree with his conclusion, which he argues for something called virtue epistemology. Hmm. Uh, It's still a helpful book from a Christian perspective on some of these issues. My bad. I was just stalling. Go ahead, brother. But no, I'll, I'll just make it real quick, just so I won't belabor the point. But you know, I'm just saying there's an interaction between the propositional and, like, say, procedural, for example. Like, with, like when the word says to be be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know I'm saying that's that's literally what that's talking about. Like, don't just hear it and have it up here, but you need to be putting it into practice. That's literally what that what that's referring to. Or when Jesus says, um, you know, we, we say it all the time. You know, the truth will set will set you free. You know, well, no, actually, actually, what Jesus said was, is if you uh, continue in my word. Then you will be my disciples and the truth will make you free. You see what I'm saying? That's that's really what it says, right? So there's this interaction. It's not just the word itself, although the word I do believe is powerful, but there's that continuing, you know what I'm saying? It's to have adopted, to have apprehended it, you know what I'm saying, to held on and remain steadfast and move forward in it. That's really what it's talking about. So, you know, there's a putting in the practice of that which is revealed, you know what I'm saying? So I think that, um, you know, I can think of another scripture. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the word of God. That's what the scripture says, right? You know, there, there's some interaction between, you know, the word of God, you know, revealed propositional knowledge, if you will, and the procedural knowledge, how you live it out. There's there's something about uh, the, their interaction there between what you know and what your lifestyle is like. And so if you're if you're imbalanced in any way, then I think what you can find yourself is in a very unhealthy position, which I think Brady did. Interestingly enough, I, I think and I'm not gonna actually. It's another video. You gotta remind me. I'm gonna do another video on it. But there's this. Um, when you look at African American history, for example, um, you have a number of folks who, you know, particularly coming from the South, who were very, who had experiences with the true and living God. You know what I'm saying? And that really marked the way that they engaged in Christianity, and particularly coming into like your late 1800s, moving towards like the the Great Migration. You know more so in the North, you began to see, as some African-Americans were able to attain education at higher levels and things like that, um, you began to see some, those who had attained a lot of propositional knowledge having some disdain you know, for forms of Christianity among, in the African-American community um, that were more experiential, like you know, like the holy rollers, so to speak. 
I'm mm-hmm. thinking about somebody like a D.A. Payne, you know, Daniel Payne. You know, he expressed some kind of disdain for that sort of thing. Yeah, he went hard. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he did. did not mince yeah, words did. for a lot of his fellow uh, preachers of the day. Oh, yeah, he, he wasn't playing around. He was calling them all kinds of names. But, but the fact of the matter is he was kind of more like a heady you mm-hmm. know, type of engagement with the faith, which, you know, this, it's cool to have that propositional knowledge, to have the education. But my point is you need both. You, see, well, you need all three. You can't be too heavy on the experiential side. You can't be too heavy on the um, the head knowledge side. Because if you're too heavy on the head knowledge side, then you have it's like what the, the scripture referred to is like you know uh, rain clouds without without water essentially. You know what I'm saying? Um, if you if you're too heavy on the pro- procedural knowledge, you're doing this and doing that, you know, for the Lord, but you don't have you know you're not engaging the experience. You don't have the head knowledge, and if it's, essentially what you end up with is is like a, a legalism of sorts. You know what I'm saying you're doing the right things, but it's just that's just that's Lord, all Lord, is. did we not? Right, it becomes legalism. So if you're too heavy on uh, pro- propositional, it's like you know you have you know it becomes empty. You know, the tinkling brass and you know all, 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 all that sort of a thing. Um, if you have too much of the procedural, then it becomes legalism. If you have too much of the experiential, then it becomes you know flippant and unanchored in some sort of uh, you know uh, objective truth. So in any way you can err. All right, let me finish this clip. I'm like, oh, shoot. What is this? I said, okay, I can do one of two things. I could either go back to doing what I've been doing the last five years, which is run from this and just try to pretend and, you know, believe as much as I can believe. Amen. As much as I can. Amen. Because I had still been going to church this entire time, still fellowshipping with believers this entire time. Um, Those close to me would say, I noticed something was off, but I was still there. I was still in the mix. I was still worshiping, still amening and still believing as much as I could. But I said, you know what? I can either go back to running, not reading the scriptures and just running. Or I could actually turn and face this and find out, okay, how am I going to look at what I've been calling God's word for 30 years of my life? How am I going to look? How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to reconcile? Can I reconcile these issues? What I've been calling God's word. Yeah. Past tense. Past tense. Yeah. I think this is the last clip coming up. It is. It's, it's brief, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And here we go. And so I spent the entire year of 2021 traveling, meeting with uh, professors and uh people who are knowledgeable in the original languages and in the scriptures and raising my issues and surprisingly finding out that I was late to the party. All the issues that I was raising, they're looking at me like, oh, like you finally got here. Welcome. Like one of them literally told me like, if you can, if you can learn to deal with these issues, then you'll be a mature Christian. Like to have wrestled with this and found a way to still believe that's, then that's when you know you've made it. I'm like, wait a minute. So, and one of them was a former professor of mine. Like, <laughs> I've talked to several professors that, I, that, that I've had in the past or who were at the schools when I was, I said, hey, but I have, some of them have written books Peter dealing Andrew. with these issues. I said, hey, I read your, your recent book. If I had taken your class back in, you know, early 2000s when I was at the school, would I have heard the things that I'm reading in your book in your class? And many of them are saying, no, I've had to rethink things since then. And the issues that you're raising right now are issues that we're all having to to think about, which only further made me say, okay, let me dive deeper now. And I'm reading all the trusted sources, the people who are bona fide, hard, like born again believers. I'm reading them first because there's some other people I could believe more liberal sources that I could start reading. And I know where they're going to take it. I want to read the, the safe people first. I'm reading the safe folks and even the safe folks are making me say it's not what I thought. I, there, there's a reason why people have been rethinking uh, these issues and um, and then I begin to venture out and read the less safe people, the liberal theologians that I'd always been warned, you don't want to go that way. <laughs> um, but eventually it got to the point where the liberal dudes were the ones bringing the most comfort because they were the ones that were being the most honest about the issues. Um, all that to say, I got to the point where I said, you know what? I can no longer in good conscience 
amen what I've amen, uh, preach what I've preached, believe what I believe. Um, the choice at that point was, am I going to do what I've seen so many others do, which is stake out a more liberal position, but still maintain my place in the Christian world, the Christian community, the as a believer, but just as a very liberal, there's another way to look at this kind of a thing. And, and I, I don't know for, for any of them, I believe many of them are being honest, they're doing what their hearts and minds can do. For me, that just felt dishonest. I felt dishonest and I said, I, I can't do that, I won't do that. I know people who, they sign statements of faith so that they can still teach at Christian universities, but they, they believe very different and they, they would hardly tell their students what they're really thinking. And I just said, I, I can't do that. I'm not the most integral guy in the world, but I can't do that. Um, my conscience wouldn't allow me. And so I said, you know what? I, I can't teach there anymore. I can't do this anymore. I bet one of the folks he's talking about is Peter Enns. Peter Enns even has a book called The Sin of Certainty. Why God mm. Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. Uh, that's that's one person I bet, you know, uh, and there's an interesting review uh, on the Gospel Coalition website of a different Peter Enns book by Robert Yarbrough titled, If This Is How the Bible Works, The Bible Doesn't Work at All. That's a review of uh, Peter Enns' new book, mm. or book at the time, called How the Bible Actually Works. And so I would almost guarantee that'd be one of the people you would talk about there. Interesting, interesting. He has another book where he defends a, an inerrantist view, sort of as a post-evangelical, called The Bible Tells Me So. So anyways, uh, Peter Enns is uh, kind of like that guy that would do that. But yeah, smart guy. Peter Enns is certainly a smart guy. And he goes in that category of post-evangelical, a little bit different than straight-up liberal, a little bit different, but uh, it's interesting. But Fanatic doesn't seem to be that. He seems to be more of the ex-evangelical Sometimes see people on Twitter yeah. now put E X, but as one word and evangelical, X evangelical, which is of course yeah. X evangelical. It's very interesting. I mean, so on the one hand, um, I find it interesting what he said about how I guess he was talking to some professors and um, he asked, him like, you know, if back in the day when I was in your class, would I have seen you talk about this? And he's like, and I guess the reply was, well, I've thought about these things since then. And, you know, I, I would teach it differently, or essentially, you know, or I'm, I'm in a different position now. And I guess he, he seems to think that that's somehow, I guess, problematic. But I, it, that just sounds to me like somebody who's a professional who's committed to, you know, finding the best way to articulate a point or defend a point. I mean, or, or the best stance to take. I don't, I don't see that as being problematic. I think they're just kind of intellectually honest. You know, I, I don't know why it would be. Like, why would it be problematic for somebody, say, you know, 10 years ago to have grown in their thinking and then would, you know, maybe take a position you know, later on? I'm not, I don't know why that would be problematic. But, you know, just little stuff like that, I kind of wonder, you know, it almost sounds like he is like, like his, um, I guess what he counts to be like, you know, um, intellectually like solid or sound, you know, would be some sort of like, okay, well, this is, you know, this is like A, B, and C. Which yeah, you know, I get it, but um, you know the reality is with imperfect people, I, I don't see anything wrong with like wrestling with the text and and, and kind of that being an aspect of what it means to be growing in the Lord. You mean kind of wrestling with, you know with the text and coming to a better understanding. Like why why would that be problematic? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's kind of odd to me. Yeah, uh, it seems like a very all or nothing proposition for him. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's kind of weird, you know. So, you know, ultimately, you know, I mean, he hasn't laid out his case in terms of what it was that he's um, that caused him to step away. But evidently, it has a great deal to do with um, what he believes to be problematic in the text. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it here, but for, for various reasons, I think I've mean, encountered a lot of arguments, you know, about, you know, uh, from a textual criticism standpoint and ultimately something to take an aim at biblical inerrancy. And I think I don't think they succeed you know, in, in undermining Christianity, but well, I kind of let him. You know, make his case first before I comment on that. But um, I think ultimately those arguments generally fail, especially if, if you're trying to improve or trying to you know disprove something like theism. Like I mean, in principle, you know, undermining scripture doesn't um, 
you know, kill the, the, the notion that, that God exists. But you know, we'll see where he goes with that. But uh, yeah, go, go ahead. No, yeah. I mean, I look forward to it in a certain sense. You know, it's not not great that this is going down. But yeah, there's uh, one book I'd recommend uh, that is, I think, the best uh, to talk about this. I, I don't know if it's letting me uh, really share anything, but um, psh, no, it's not. Uh, whatever. But um, it, it's still not. Yeah, it's OK. There's a book I recommend about somebody's talking about that I think is excellent, excellent book. Mm. It gets a little deep at points, so so you got to wade through it, everybody. But it's called Do Historical Matters Matter to Faith? Do mm. Historical Matters Matter to Faith? It's uh, subtitled A Critical Appraisal of Modern and Postmodern Approaches to Scripture, edited by James K. Hoffmeyer and Dennis McGarry. Excellent book. This this book is so helpful because uh, it's published by Crossway, by the way, in 2012. Even just the way it begins with uh, part chapter one, listen to this, religious epistemology, theological interpretation of scripture, and critical biblical scholarship of theologians' reflections, Thomas McCall. That chapter alone, I think, really uh, helps set up for what Brady ends up talking about, because it has to do with your epistemological foundation. And then when you approach critical biblical scholarship, and uh, it's just such a helpful discussion. It's very philosophical, but the whole book's really good. And uh, again, titled Do Historical Matters Matter to Faith? If you go through that and read that, I think when you hear these things, you'll be prepared. But the book can be deep waiting if you don't have the, the background from it. But if someone wants a, a deeper discussion, it's not like these little quick answers like that. For that, maybe um, I'm not discounting it, but if, if someone's like, well, I want to know about this, but I can't do that, maybe you get Paul Copan's That's Just Your Interpretation. That's kind of a helpful one. That's what that's called because, you know, Brady kind of referred to that kind of thing. Paul Copan's That's Just Your Interpretation, I think, uh, might be helpful on that. But, uh, yeah, that's all I got. I just want to recommend a couple books before I get out of here. You know, I'm, I'm, this is an interesting question here, and I want to get back to it in a second, but, but you just said something that's going to – that took me back to something I wanted to say earlier because he was talking about how you could – according to him, kind of Rubik's Cube, the scriptures, any which way, you know, and he kind of alluded to there being some sort of like no fixed meaning, you know, right. of the text. And you just kind of make it whatever you want. And he said, he said something to the effect of like, how, like, there's no way to say who's right. And man, that's just, again, it just, that's an, that was just another one of those red flags that kind of got me. It's like, I don't know. This seems extremely irrational to me because the reality is the way that you would know who's right is by examining the text and, at very least, you know, you can say we like maybe a better question is like, you know, what stance is rational? You know I'm saying like, can you rationally affirm that this interpretation is correct? And do you have good reasons to affirm that? that? I think that's a that's a better question. Now, I don't think that we have to be infallible. I think I can be wrong about an interpretation. I'm, I'm, I don't I don't claim infallibility or inerrancy for myself. You know what I'm saying? Nevertheless, my goal is if I can look at a text and say, OK, well, it says this. And I have rational grounds to do so, meaning I can appeal to you know, what it says in the Greek. I can look at context, what was going on at the time. If I've got a, a, a ra you know, rational grounds to affirm what it is um, you know, that, I'm, that I'm seeing there in the text, then it's not true you know, that you can just fix it in any kind of way. Either you have rational grounds for what you're saying the text says, or you don't. I think that's, that's just a, a better way to look at mm -hmm. it. You, know what I'm saying? you don't have to claim infallibility, but like, oh, well, I, it's definitely this, you know what I'm saying, in the sense of, well, no, I think the text says such and such because for, for these reasons. And I think that's sufficient for, for a biblical understanding. But this person here says, uh, it was just <coughs> Kappa Kappa Psi, uh, says, great teaching question. Why do all these people act like their doubts are brand new and no one has ever asked before because the Bible ain't new and these issues you know, addressed? I think, I think it needs been addressed. And I think it's kind of, it's funny because just in this last clip, he said that when he started going to the professors, they was like, dog, you late to the party. You know, and I guess he takes that to be like, you know, I guess the implication for some might be like, oh, man, there's like this conspiracy of unbelieving, you know, theologians. And, you know, he just showed up in the, in the door and they, they kind of welcomed him, him in and said, oh, I'm glad you know now. That, that kind of a thing. Whereas I, I, mean, I seriously doubt that was the case. It's just simply that to say that, you know, it, it's not new. You know, the, the, the things that he's wrestling with probably have been wrestled with, you know, by, by others. Um, and there's no, nothing they gave, scandalous they about that. They gave him the professor's version of I've been had those. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Like you think you know something new? It's like, oh, like we've been here, bro. You know what I mean? And and the thing of it is, like, okay, yeah, it might be new to you, but there's nothing wrong. There's there's nothing scandalous about there being elements of your know, textual interpretation or whatever it may be that people are still working on and trying to understand. And it's, that's just been the case. I mean, this people who get paid to do that, that's what they do. <laughs> their, their job is to wrestle with things that, that, you know, need to be wrestled with. That's, that's, I don't know why that would be uh, scandalous to them, but anyway, that's what, that's what I got on that, man. Yeah. Well, uh, everyone pray for Brady. Uh, but also, you know, let's, let's gear up. You know, we got to be able to, to answer these things and be well, like, we're okay having the, the tough, hard discussion. And, uh, you know, we're okay with that. I just hope everyone else is, is as well, you know? Yeah, I feel great about it. I mean, and, yeah, last thing I'm going to say is that, you know, I think, again, sometimes, I, you know, there's a tendency among some of us, you know, maybe we just kind of wire this way to privilege what we don't know. And yeah, I just want to encourage people like just because it's something that you don't know, that in and of itself doesn't undermine what it is that you do know. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, if you have good grounds to affirm Christianity, that's not somehow, you know, undone by the fact that you still have questions, you know. And so you don't have to jump ship just because there are things that you have yet to know. You know and I think that we can be confident on that. So um, let's get up out of here, man. It's been like two and a half hours, bro. <laughs> I didn't, you know, didn't anticipate. That was a lot that, of but, uh, uh, just real quick. Oh, man. Yeah, a lot of just real quicks there. You know what I mean? But you know, it is what it is, man. We, we, we try to do what we can do, you know. But um, yeah, man, you, uh, you got anything coming up? You want to, you got our last words, I mean? You oh, wanna, you, you wanna share know anything? what I got coming up, man. Yeah, of course, of course. Doctrine for the Block, Urban Apologetics Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. There it if is. If you're in the area, come if not, just look for this new book I'm working on because one day it's going to come out because it's almost done. It's called Street <laughs> Level Epistemology. Right. And Adam contributed. Days. There we go, man. So, yeah, y'all be on the lookout, man. We're going to do some more of this stuff, you know what I'm saying, as as this uh, discussion with Brady moves forward. I'm looking forward to, you know, digging into the points that he brings up because I think it's an opportunity to, um, you know, deepen our understanding of the biblical worldview, deepen our faith. And uh, and move forward in Christ, and hopefully show you know show love to Him. You know what I'm saying uh, by telling the truth in love. You know what I'm saying and uh, kind of going from there. So y'all know what it is. Love God, love people. Take care of the things that God blesses you with. Peace. I've got a song for you. Share.